open to the public. Coming up next, a hearing on nuclear waste disposal with the House Interior and Insular Affairs Subcommittee on Energy and Environment. The subcommittee, chaired by Democratic Congressman George Miller of California, met to hear testimony on a new policy by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. This new policy deregulates some low-level atomic wastes from laboratories, hospitals, and nuclear plants. The new policy exempts waste that subject an individual to radiation doses of less than 10 millirems a year, or about half the level of a normal chest x-ray. The subcommittee released documents showing that both the EPA and some NRC staff advisors have strongly opposed this new deregulation policy, and several lawmakers expressed concern that some states could become dumping grounds for radioactive garbage. The topic of today's hearing is a below regulatory concern policy recently issued by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission to deregulate nuclear waste and other radioactive materials. This proposal is an unprecedented reversal of current policy, which requires that radioactive waste from nuclear reactors be disposed of in specially designed repositories licensed and regulated by the NRC. The purpose of today's hearing is to review both the substance of the BRC policy and the process which was used to develop it. I think that this is a policy that has raised considerable concern among our colleagues here in the, uh, in the House of Representatives and in the, uh, and in the, in the Senate. And we uh, will be hearing from some of those individuals later on, but because of, uh, of delays and changes in schedule, I would like to, uh, uh, to begin with, with, with Mr. Richard Guyman, who is the Director of the Office of Radiation Programs for the Environmental Protection Agency. I would say that uh, Senator Mitchell, the Majority Leader of the Senate, was scheduled to testify. He is, is at the White House with the, uh, uh, with the Budget Summit and, uh, and will be delayed and has, has sent a, uh, a statement over that will be included in the, uh, in the record. And Ms. Guyman, welcome to the, uh, excuse me, let me recognize Congressman Sharp for any statement that he may have. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, like you, uh, I am concerned about where we are headed on uh, low-level nuclear uh, waste. We have a policy requiring states to agree with other states or to set up their own disposal systems. And the issue here is whether some of that waste is viewed as not sufficiently dangerous that it could be put in with other kinds of normal landfill dumping. I think many of us are deeply concerned about this because we are seeing a reversal in the point of view that the National Academy of Sciences took for many years in which they diminished the significance or the danger to health of any of this low-level uh, materials. Uh, and indeed, they are now saying that they were wrong. The National Academy of Sciences group that has reviewed this since the 1950s is saying that they were wrong. They underestimated the threat to, uh, to public health. And they are arguing that it may be three to four times more carcinogenic than originally uh, thought to be. My concern here is to make sure we're doing the utmost to protect the public. I trust that is a, a central concern of the NRC. But secondly, I'm uh, directly concerned about the policy that seeks to exercise the strongest federal preemption, meaning that those states which are seeking to have the cleanest uh, amount, the best cleanup, the best that they can do in terms of preventing this stuff from get, getting to exposed to the public, will be preempted from exercising their authority if the NRC should grant uh, an exemption uh, to uh, uh, any particular material. So, Mr. Chairman, this is an important question. It, it's raised timely. The NRC, of course, is not deciding any specific material or any specific case. It is simply laying out a, a way in which it will make these decisions in the future. But it's important that we review that now before we have one of those cases uh, tossed in our laps uh, and have a major dispute over it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Pardon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to first of all express my appreciation that you called me chairing on this very time. <laughs> time <to talk. laughs> 
welcome the witnesses here. I see two of the members of the House already here, as well as officials from EPA and uh, NRC. Uh, like you, Mr. Chairman, I've got an open mind on the subject and look forward to hearing that. Thank you. Mr. Skyman, we're going to ask if you just might wait a second. Mr. Atkins is here. Mr. Houghton is here. Uh, why don't you come forward to the, uh, to the witness table. Chad, Amo, welcome to the, uh, to the committee. We look, uh, we look forward to your testimony, and we, uh, uh, we thank you for, uh, for taking time to become involved in, uh, uh, in, this, uh, in this issue. And uh, Chet, we'll begin with you. And Emil. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and let me thank you and the members of the subcommittee for your very timely concern on this issue. Uh, I think your leadership has been particularly important to alerting the public as to precisely what's recommended here. Uh, I was first alerted to the NRC's uh, forthcoming below regulatory concern policy several months ago when a number of towns in my community <coughs> and communities in my district uh, passed um, resolutions uh, recommending a repeal of Section 10 of the low-level radioactive waste policy amendments of 1985. Uh, that's when you look at that kind of thing, it's rarely that a town, and these things were passed uh, almost unanimously by the towns, when a town would get involved at this level of concern about what would seem to be an arcane policy um, of a federal agency. But the problem is that our communities have lived with the tremendous gamesmanship and politicization of the licensure of the Seabrook uh, nuclear power plant in New Hampshire. And the concern has been that rules are being twisted and bent and changed around, not with public safety in mind, but with pressures from industry to, to lower cost. And really what people in my communities have felt is that we're taking a situation, disposal of uh, nuclear contaminated material and moving it from a crisis stage into the catastrophe stage. And people, as a matter of fact, in one of my communities, they uh, suggested that if this were a motion picture, the promotional ads would state, from the government agency that changed its rules to license the Seabrook nuclear plant, now comes a policy that will be even more controversial and more destructive a policy that will allow greater numbers of people to receive greater exposure to deadly radiation, the BRC policy, coming soon to a landfill near you. That's the level of constituent concern about this policy. And the concern exists because the NRC is essentially abandoning the concept of cradle-to-grave monitoring. It's a concept which we've accepted for all hazardous wastes in all of the legislation that's been passed to regulate these things. It's a policy which really will create enormous problems. Uh, people are not going to know how low-level <coughs> low wastes are being disposed of, whether they're in landfills, burned in incinerators, poured down sewers, or recycled in consumer products without anyone monitoring the concentrations of these materials in waste streams and where they're eventually going to end up. Uh, the NRC policy also changes uh, a situation in terms of the so-called accumulated practices. And the BRC policy allows deregulation of any practice which is pro projected to cause exposures of less than 10 millirems each year. The policy would allow landfills, incinerators, and other facilities to receive waste from a number of different so-called practices, which means that the accumulated levels, uh, radiation levels, could be significantly higher than 10 millirems. Uh, the, the Commission says that it will have reasonable assurance that exposures from deregulated activities in such instances will not exceed 100 millirems per year. But how can it possibly do that, give that assur <coughs> assurance, if it abandons its responsibility of tracking the whereabouts of the BRC waste? Uh, I would also point out that even if this provision was enforceable, a 100 millirem exposure level creates a 3.5 out of 1,000 risk of cancer, which is 20 times higher than that's 
that's allowed in Great Britain and ten times higher than that suggested by the International Commission on Radiological Protection. Uh, finally, uh, there's the issue that's of particular concern uh, to my communities, whether states and localities should have the ability to say no to a policy which they clearly think poses harm to their environment and the health of their citizens and which will make the already difficult task of siting landfills next to impossible. In Massachusetts, 30 cities and towns have taken a formal position against the BRC policy and legislation is pending at the State House to require disposal of low-level radioactive waste in properly licensed facilities. The NRC can make all the assurances it wants, but I believe it's appropriate for those who will suffer the consequences of the BRC policy to decide whether they want to participate. Unfortunately, the policy that is being considered today would preempt the ability of states and localities to regulate low-level radioactive waste within their borders. So I would hope that this committee uh, would be able to send a very decisive message uh, to the NRC. They have created enormous problems, uh, not just for communities and people's concerns for their health and safety, but also for industry as well. I have several industries in my district that generate uh, fairly large amounts of low-level nuclear waste. Uh, they have not favored this legislation. And their concern is that what's happened is that their practices, which have been sound practices in the past, are now in jeopardy and things that they were able to do, they are now viewed as an unwanted citizen in the communities because of fear that uh, somehow, even though they have no intention of using the BRE, BRC, they'll be allowed to dispose of some of their waste in the local landfill. So this is a policy that, while it may have been intended to help industry, hurts a large number of industries and also puts a sword of Damocles uh, over the heads of entire communities. Thank you. Thank you. Congressman Houghton. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I thank you very much for letting me be here. I associate myself with uh, Mr. Atkins in thanking you for holding these hearings. Uh, they're timely, they're well worth it, and uh, I hope I will have something to, to add to the deliberations. Um, I'm not going to take a great deal of your time because I do have uh, written testimony and also I have a letter accompanying that testimony from friends of mine and associates in Allegheny County, which is a county in upstate New York that I represent. Uh, so I am here not only for myself, but also from the citizens of that uh, county who are very concerned with the NRC uh, uh, policy decision here. I am not a great technical expert. I don't understand uh, uh, the full impact of uh, Millerem dosages. Uh, I'm not a scientist in this area. However, I have been in the course of my business career connected with, uh, uh, with the nuclear industry and know a little bit about it, its impact, and the, and the waste uh, uh, reactions. Um, I think there's three points I'd like to make, Mr. Chairman. First of all is the NRC, it appears to me, and I understand uh, what they're trying to do. But the NRC, uh, to me, is heading south where the rest of the country is heading north. Uh, and uh, I just can't imagine a worse timing uh, than, than this to make a statement. Uh, uh, science is uh, still trying to sort out uh, the, uh, the impact of nuclear residue, and the map keeps changing. And, and, and all the time, you get differing views in terms of what is dangerous and what is not. So my feeling, if there's any question uh, about uh, w no matter what the, uh, uh, the, the radiation impact is, if there's any question of the impact uh, on individual people, then it's wrong to proceed. And I do not think the science has a definitive answer at this point. Also, from, uh, from my standpoint, uh, I, I have to look at it, uh, as I want to look at it, from the human uh, uh, position. Uh, I represent people in, in Allegheny County. They are very scared. Uh, the state has arbitrarily said that there will be a nuclear waste dump put probably in that county. It's wrong. Uh, there are already 140 sites in New York uh, State. Uh, there are unusual people in this county, not only good, decent people who work hard and pay their bills uh, and, and so on and so forth, but, but there are some high highly competent technical experts who are worried about this. And uh, it just seems, from a human standpoint, that the state and the federal government to superimpose from on high their own views at this particular time 
uh, with the lack of definitive knowledge is absolutely wrong. So that is my statement. I rest on that. I will submit my testimony, and I thank you very much for letting me be here. <coughs> Well, thank you, uh, Amo and, and, and Chet, very much for your uh, uh, for your participation this morning, for your for your statements. I think you both raised uh, critical questions that uh, hopefully this hearing will uh, will begin to answer. Uh, and I think you you raised questions in in uh, in a very ordinary sense, uh, and that is the same questions that our that our constituents have and and and. Uh, uh, local elected officials have uh, have bombarded us with about this uh, about this policy. Uh, when you when you take this policy and, and, and the questions of dosage, the, the questions of, of monitoring, chat that you have raised, and you combine that with the notion of, of preemption and a say by the uh, by the state with respect to this, uh, it obviously raises the anxiety level of uh, of people. Uh, at the uh, at the local level, that uh, not only are there differing opinions about the wisdom of this policy, but then the ability of, of local people to to affect the outcome of that policy, I think, is just sort of core to our uh, our existence. Uh, both of you have raised the the issues of, of landfill, and uh, I would just have to say uh, I have uh, in, in the district that I represent have, have been watching a war being waged between. Uh, uh, citizens of one uh, one community against another, uh, turning one town against another, uh, trying to find a site for. There's no question we need one. There's no question we're going to have one, but of course the siting of that becomes very controversial. To now throw this issue into the middle of that debate to me is almost inconceivable uh, that that uh, uh, that that could be done. And uh, it apparently has been raised in a number of other areas where there's hotly contested uh, battles over, over landfill siting. Uh, so these, I don't think the questions are terribly complicated. The policy you know, has, uh, has, some, has some scientific questions raised about it. But in terms of its impact on our constituents and, and, uh, and governing officials, I think the, the fairly, fairly simple questions that don't appear that they have, uh, they have been asked or answered in the process of, of developing this policy. I, so I really thank you very much for your, uh, for your participation. Congressman Sharp. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate our, our colleagues. They, uh, they obviously are dealing in a very personal way with this issue, and that's the way this issue has to be dealt with because uh, people's health and lives are, are at stake. And uh, normally we uh, seek to have a product demonstrated to us that there's something dangerous to it. But this is quite a reverse. Uh, a situation where we want the comfort of knowing it's demonstrated safe, uh, and that's a serious problem that we're going to be dealing with here. And I certainly think that we do not want to uh, to quickly uh, uh, allow these things in the marketplace. I mean, the smoke detector question I think is one that, that needs to be raised. We many of us probably have them in our houses, which have slightly radioactivity to them, <coughs> and uh, they've been exempted from disposal. And and my concern, frankly, is that that. If the view is that they're not very dangerous, still I would like to know when they were changed in my own home that they weren't turned over to my kids to play with for two days, that they should have been uh, gotten out of the house immediately. I simply don't know the answer to that situation because I had no idea that it might be one of those that uh, has some radioactivity material in it. And I think these kind of things uh, on products need to be, uh, be clear to us in the public so we can do our job, so the state can do its job. And we, of course, need to do ours at the federal level. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Any <coughs> questions? I know you have a statement, but if you have questions, then they can. I'd like to thank you, Mr. Chairman. I apologize I wasn't here sooner. I look forward to reading the testimony of our two uh, colleagues here. I'd ask unanimous consent that my opening statement may be submitted to the record. Oh. Thank well, you I, very much. Yes. Yes. Could I just make one? Uh, <coughs> sure. You know, that there are certain sciences which uh, sort of run their string yeah. and you, you, you're you almost positive what the reactions are going to be. You can predict the inevitability of what, what the uh, concerns will be. There are other sciences which are in the, uh, in really in an embryonic state of evolving, and I think this is one of them. The NRC may be right, but you can't be sure, and it isn't worth taking that chance. Thank you. Mr. Gunner, back to you. Again, welcome to the, uh, uh, to the committee. And 
If I understand, you have you have been informed. It is the uh, the practice of uh, this subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it at investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? No, I do not. You rise and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of the rules, I am informed, have been previously provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you, do you desire to be represented by counsel? No, I do not. Thank you. Your, uh, your, your written statement will be placed in the record in its entirety. You proceed in the manner in which you're uh, most comfortable, and we appreciate you uh, taking your time and effort to come before the committee. Okay. I will, uh, I will just summarize my, uh, my statement for, uh, for time considerations here now, uh, since you uh, have graciously put, agreed to put the whole thing into the record. Uh, again, good morning, Mr. Chairman, members of the subcommittee. My name is Richard Guyman. I'm the director of the Office of Radiation Programs and the Environmental Protection Agency. I'm also Assistant Surgeon General in the United States Public Health Service. I appreciate the opportunity to testify on the subject of establishing levels of below regulatory concern, or BRC, for radioactive materials. Since the issuance of a BRC policy by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, this issue has received increasing public attention. It is also a matter of direct concern for the <coughs> Environmental Protection Agency. My testimony this morning, I will describe EPA's interpretation of below regulatory concern, the concepts for establishing BRC levels, a brief evolution of the BRC concept, federal roles and responsibilities, and the agency's thoughts on the NRC's final policy statement on BRC. I'll conclude by offering some further recommendations for making the BRC concept a reality. What is a BRC level? A BRC level for radioactive materials is a level of radiation exposure below which the associated risk to public health will not will be small and the effort and cost to further reduce it would not be warranted given the amount of additional risk reduction achieved. This is not to say that such a level is risk-free. EPA recognizes that this remaining risk should be estimated and adequate assurances must be given that it is not unreasonable in light of the benefits of deregulating it. A BRC level should be established for specific practices should therefore not be confused with a ger generic de minimis level or a level at which we, we don't really have any health concerns about. In con if a generic de minimis risk level were determined, it would be at or below a, any BRC level. Now, some of the concepts for establishing BRC levels, there appear to be two essential elements of any decision not to regulate an otherwise beneficial practice which can cause radiation exposure. The first is that the deleterious impact of the practice on health in the exposed population, when taken as a whole, is small enough that the effort and expense of regulation is not warranted. That is, the exemption is as low as reasonably achievable. The second is that the risk to any person is small enough that the majority of individuals would not consider it of concern. We believe that both of these criteria must be satisfied in establishing a BRC level We've incorporated this philosophy into our own development of any BRC criteria. The assessment of possible BRC levels should examine individual risks, population risks, possible cost savings, as well as the cumulative impacts from multiple actions. In addition to the basic assessment of risks and costs, the analysis should consider many other factors, including consistency with previous risk management decisions on not only radiation, but chemicals and various other types of hazardous materials. The concept of BRC has received considerable attention from state, national, and international authorities. For instance, the International Atomic Energy Agency issued its principles for exemption of radiation sources and practices from regulatory control. They concluded that individual doses of about one millirem per year from each exempted source, leading to a total dose from all sources of a few millirems per year, were reasonable but only if the societal impact were sufficiently low and the exposure was justified. The NRC's recent policy statement on below regulatory concern is the first attempt to establish a broadly applicable BRC level. This policy will apply to any and all practices. While it is a policy and not a formal regulation, it does provide guidance where none currently exists. We believe it is fair to say that the NRC policy has greatly expanded the radiation community's interpretation of BRC. In 1970, 
reorganization plan number three created EPA and transferred to EPA the Atomic Energy Act authority to establish generally applicable radiation protection standards. EPA standards may be in the form of limitations on radiation exposure or levels or concentrations or quantities of radioactive material in the general environment outside the controlled boundaries of locations using radioactive materials. When an EPA standard is promulgated under the Atomic Energy Act, the requirements of the EPA standard are to be incorporated into NRCs and the Department of Energy's respective regulatory and pro programmatic frameworks. In other words, EPA establishes generally applicable environmental standards and NRC and DOE implement them. In the case of BRC, EPA has not promulgated criteria for a specific practice or group of practices. Pending such promulgation of criteria, NRC's policy will will most likely govern the radiation community. EPA appreciates the wide spectrum of technical and regulatory issues to be faced by NRC in the near future. However, any attempts to deregulate radioactive materials must be handled with extreme sensitivity to the concerns of the public. Such a policy must be clear in its intent and should spell out how it is expected to be implemented. As you know, EPA previously commented on NRC's draft BRC policy has had only limited time to review the final policy issued on June 27, 1990. Before we can comment in detail on NRC's policy, clarification is needed as to how the policy will work. However, there are a number of areas where we will be watching very closely as the Commission carries out its BRC policy through its rules and licensing activities. One of these areas is the protection of drinking water, especially where groundwater is the source. For instance, the NRC policy would allow some people to be exposed up to 10 millirem per year from an exempted source, an exempted practice. EPA's drinking water standards limit exposure to no more than 4 millirems per year. Policy is unclear how it would apply in a situation where drinking water is a real or potential exposure route. Another area in the policy that needs further clarification is the definition of a practice. For low-level radioactive disposal alone, it is conceivable that numerous waste streams or groups of waste streams may be petitioned to be classified as BRC wastes. One final area we'd like to mention today that needs some further clarification is the application of the one millirem per year interim criteria described in the NRC policy. It appears that the Commission has great latitude in its ability to limit certain practices to a level of one millirem per year, although it is unclear how, how, how it will go about defining such practices. If the majority of the exemption decisions were guided by the interim criteria and they implemented them at one millirem per year rather than 10 or higher, then we believe that many of the objections to the NRC's policy would be alleviated. I'd like to conclude my remarks by saying that EPA believes that a prudently implemented BRC concept is feasible and can be protective of public health and the environment. Such a policy, however, must be developed and implemented in a way that fosters better public understanding and confidence in the federal government's handling of radioactive materials. We believe that it would be foolish for us to dismiss the concept of BRC entirely. Certain economic realities exist in this country relating to the cleanup and decommissioning of materials. We believe that it would be foolish for us to dismiss the concept of BRC entirely. Certain economic realities exist in this country relating to the cleanup and decommissioning of nuclear facilities that do not afford us this luxury. However, we owe it to the public and ourselves to develop and implement such a policy in an open and coordinated manner. As suggested in our January 1989 testimony on NRC's draft policy statement on BRC, we propose that a task force be established to develop a common framework for exemption decisions by EPA and NRC that will effectively discharge our shared and complementary responsibilities to protect public health and the environment. Thank you very much for the opportunity to discuss this issue. I'll be glad to answer any questions you may have. Scott, if you just remain there for a minute, we have another one of our colleagues who wants to testify. You can just, sure. just sit right where you are. Congressman Ray Hall, and uh, come forward. And I'd like to acknowledge that the Chairman, Mr. Udall, has, uh, has joined the, uh, the committee, and uh, Mr. Clark has, uh, has joined the uh, Committee during your uh, your testimony. Do you have any statement? I would ask unanimous consent to put my statement in the record, so that we can have more time for the, the witnesses. Jamie, do you have any? Congressman Clark, do you have a statement? In that no, 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 no. Thank you, Congressman Ray Hall. 
Well, okay. Nick, welcome to your own committee here. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to testify today and <laughs> applaud you for calling these very timely and important hearings on a very controversial and emotional, emotional issue that, of course, uh, accurately describes any discussion of low-level radioactive waste disposals. disposals. The uh, NRC's low-level radioactive waste policy strikes fear in my home state of West Virginia, and it strikes that fear for very good reason. This policy has the potential of establishing West Virginia as the nation's low-level radioactive waste dumping ground. I'm afraid that in the end, my home state of West Virginia will become one of the biggest losers as a result of this policy. Solid waste disposal, and in particularly out-of-state solid waste disposal, has been one of the most highly charged issues in the state of West Virginia, independent of the NRC's recent low-level radioactive waste policy. The nation's landfill crisis has provided and has pivoted my home state into a very precarious position. As such, the state has become the target for municipal waste disposal from northeastern states such as New Jersey and Pennsylvania. As landfills in these and other states reach their capacity, West Virginia has become more and more attractive as an alternative site for the disposal of their waste. In addition, our vast landscape is a perfect magnet for landfill proposals that are sometimes unprecedented in their size and in their scope. In fact, many abandoned strip mines have become home to local landfills. It does not take a brain surgeon, Mr. Chairman, to conclude that NRC's policy coupled with the interest of northeastern states in making West Virginia their alternative dump site is a deadly combination for the residents of my state. Nonetheless, West Virginians historically have stood firm in their opposition to out-of-state waste as county by county has objected to the siting of these types of landfills in their backyards. The objections stem from the fear of groundwater contamination, pollution, and the stigma that is being attached to out-of-state garbage recipients. In some instances, citizens have even resorted to violence to stop out-of-state waste from coming in to their county. The NRC's policy is of special concern to McDowell County, which I have the honor of representing. Currently, there is a proposal to site a landfill that would accept 220,000 tons of waste per month. This landfill would accept out-of-state waste. I fear that the NRC's policy may potentially result in McDowell County becoming the designated home to local as well as out-of-state low-level radioactive waste as it becomes mixed with ordinary municipal waste. The West Virginia State Legislature has been working to close the door inch by inch on out-of-state waste. Legislation enacted just four months ago gives citizens a greater voice in stopping landfill proposals. Several counties have enacted ordinances to require recycling, which acts to preclude out-of-state waste, since most interstate waste transporters do not separate paper, glass, and metals prior to the drop-off. Former Governor Arch Moore in 1988 even went so far as to issue an executive order banning out-of-state waste, despite a Supreme Court ruling that such bans are unconstitutional. This order eventually was overruled by a federal judge. The NRC policy is no friend to West Virginia, and in particular to McDowell County. In fact, states currently are looking to dispose of their waste in West Virginia will be even more anxious to do so in order to prevent low-level radioactive waste from being dumped in their own state. If the people of West Virginia are viewed as being concerned about out-of-state waste now, before the NRC's policy, and I submit just wait until the NRC approves a low-level radioactive waste disposal petition to see what will happen. I fear that there will be an outright rebellion. Mr. Chairman, it is my hope and, and it will be my position to continue to do all I can to protect West Virginia from any possibility of out-of-state low-level radioactive waste coming into our borders. I conclude by again commending you for this uh, hearing and for the uh, interest and concern and the expertise with which this subcommittee has dealt with this issue over so many years. I'd be glad to respond to questions. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, do you have any questions for Mr. Rahal? Any questions? Mr. Darden? Uh, yes. Uh, Mr. Rahal, is your uh, concern here the actual level of waste that qualifies uh, for the BRC uh, category, or is it 
or uh, is it the establishment of the category itself? I would say to my good friend from Georgia, it is the establishment of the category itself. Uh, once that uh, is established, then the perception that is fostered from there on and, the, uh, and perhaps the reality is that we would then become the dumping ground and that is not what we want to even open the door by any stretch of the imagination. So as a, as a practical matter then, once the category is established, then you believe that it would cause an excessive amount of uh, material, regardless of what the level was, to be brought to, brought to West Virginia then? That's accurate. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Clark? No, no question, Mr. Chairman. Th thank you very much for your, uh, for your testimony. And uh, obviously, we expect you to uh, participate in the deliberations of this committee as we continue to, uh, to look at this matter. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, George. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Skyman, thank you for your, uh, for your testimony and uh, for your, your, your statement here. Uh, let me, if I just might, uh, maybe the easiest way to, to sort of uh, review your, uh, your statement and some of the issues that have been raised uh, by it and by uh, EPA with respect to uh, this policy uh, is to go through uh, a document uh, that I believe is prepared by uh, uh, by, your, by the Office of Radiation Programs, your staff, and it's, the one I have is, is, uh, is dated uh, June 27, 1990. Uh, to begin with, uh, let, let's just look at it, it, what you're saying here. In, in the first paragraph there, paragraph number one, you say, we believe that this is too high a level for blanket deregulation criterion is not protective of the public health. Can you elaborate on that and, and tell us why uh, your staff arrived at that conclusion? The, the reason that, uh, that we concluded that here is that we believe that if you're going to deregulate materials and allow them to go out and possibly have multiple sources come up, they ought to be at very, very low, low levels so that even multiple sources will be at small amounts. Uh, as we try to compare what would be done uh, in this area with what are international guidelines, with which our, our suggestions for chemical waste and other hazardous waste, our concerns were that the risk levels here uh, tended to be uh, higher than some of those other guidelines, higher than we allowed for certain other kinds of waste at the, say, 10 millirem or greater than 10 millirem level. Uh, if you, uh, if on the other hand you exempted levels below that, nearly one millirem per year or somewhere between, then I think that we found that there was going to be more comparability. A key concern is groundwater protection. How does that, uh, uh, if I might ask how you, that statement uh, uh, that you just responded to, how does that combine with, with your statement uh, on page 7 uh, in the middle paragraph there when you say one final area we'd like to mention is the needs for some further clarifications on the application of this? Well, how it combines there is if you would read the NRC policy, the policy says that they were creating an interim criteria of one millirem for certain very widespread applications that might involve extremely large uh, population segments. Uh, and Excuse me, I just ask you to back up again in layman's terms. Um, you say very wide applications. Right. If I, I gather the one millirem would apply to com consumer type products that might involve millions of people, okay, that might be exposed to say hundreds of thousands or millions of people, whereas uh, the the level of 10 millirem per year would, would apply to smaller groups, uh, you know, thousands perhaps. I think the NRC would be better off to clarify what they meant by that. But our view was is that if you used, if you were governed by the 1 millirem value, that you would be, uh, that would deal with a lot of the criticism that has been heard by international community or by a lot of the people in this country and even some of the concerns that we've had as opposed to uh, general blanket implementation of a 10 millirem or higher value. That's because the one the one millirem would allow for a wider dispersal of that exposure. No, that's because one millirem would be a much smaller risk. One millirem would be at but over, of ten of ten, right. and as a consequence of that, the likelihood of individuals getting substantial amount of risks uh, and the population getting substantial amount are much smaller. Okay. 
You, if, back to the, uh, the June 27th statement, in, in the second paragraph you say that, that furthermore the policy statement gives no assurance as to how the NRC would monitor these potential multiple exposures to evaluate their collective effect. Uh, again, the, the problem I think that we've had in trying to fully evaluate what the impact of the policy would be is that, uh, is that there are still a lot of details that one does not understand how it will be carried out. Details on, although there's indications that they're going to look at this and in individual licensing activities elsewhere, there's no details on to how monitoring would be done. There's no details on to how they would define specific, specific practices at this point. Therefore, practice might be defined very narrowly and as a consequence have many, many different sources that would be exempted, or it could be defined very broadly and therefore have very few individuals. Give me an example of those two. Uh, an, an example would be you could say that uh, one practice would be, say, all, all radioactive, all low-level radioactive waste from, say, a nuclear power plant, okay, and anything that met your criteria within that broad definition would be applicable. That would therefore mean that all of it would have to be added together. Uh, consequently, it would limit the amount from any individuals very much. However, a more narrow definition would say that we're going to let it apply to uh, you know, 15 different types of waste streams that might, com might come from a nuclear power plant. So then since each individual waste stream could be exempted at either 1 to 10 millirem per year, conceivably you might ultimately have additions of each of those waste streams and you'd have, you know, 10 plus 10 plus 10 plus 10. That's now, what would, what would be uh, uh, your, I guess, uh, your preference, if, if that's a proper word here, in, in, in this discussion of how that would be monitored? What, what, what would your expectations be on how that should, that should be done or what have you been well, I think our expectation would be that, first of all, that there would be obviously thorough analysis done before any individual waste streams were exempted to see how they conceivably would interact with various other waste streams that might be exempted uh, so that if you had a, a landfill, for example, if you had 15 different waste streams, each of which was exempted, likely to go to that landfill, uh, you would not exempt them because of the fact that you're very concerned that multiple exposures might go in. So you'd, you'd do this by a technical analysis plus some kind of a monitoring or tracking that is record keeping or some uh, possible manifestation along the lines depending upon the individual waste streams that are being evaluated. Who would monitor that? Well, it's not clear at this point how that would, would work. I gather that uh, I think that you'd have to ask NRC as to what they might propose in dealing with this. In, in some of EPA's rules for solid waste and stuff, they require certain manifestations, certain record keeping by the, um, by the licensee or by the permittee, by the vendor that's involved, and that then is subject to review by the agency should it want to. Paragraph 3, your opening, uh, the opening sentence there of the staff is that the NRC policy statement also states that the Commission will not take the responsibility for determining whether a practice for which they are considering BRC exemption is justified. What are you, what are you, what's your staff saying there? Over the, over the past many years, it's been a general principle in radiation protection worldwide that you don't frivolously expose people to radiation exposure, that you have a good reason for, uh, for exposing them. Or as a consequence, even though one conceivably could have a, you know, a nice little, uh, say, a toy ball for a child that would, uh, uh, made of glowing material, so it would glow at night, that's obviously a frivolous exposure and you wouldn't allow that to be done even though the exposure would be very... That's current law, current procedure, current it's what? It's general, it's, it's a basic principle of radiation protection that has pretty much been incorporated into individual agencies uh, throughout various governments throughout the world as well as international bodies that recommend guidelines such as the International Commission on Radiation Protection or the National Council on Radiation Protection. What what we're saying here is that that could, should continue. That is, one should still make sure that anything that one might use radioactive material in is still justified. There's a good reason to do it. What, what, how, does this, how does this policy then change that? This would allow for what? It, it, again, I, I would suggest that you ask the Commission to elaborate how they perceive this would go, but it appears that 
they are eliminating Senator justification Biden. as a as a requirement that the commission will not in require that the that these low levels that are exempted that you will have to justify that there's a true benefit of using the radiation for this material in a his, in a in a, in a historical note that would that would be a change of formal policy is it not I mean isn't it doesn't if you go back to I think, I think generally, 64, generally 65, through radiation protection is I would Again, I would defer to the Commission to, to tell you how this would modify what their general policies have been. No, I understand that. I'm asking why, I mean, what is it that you saw in the policy that we, we caused you to make that statement? I assume it's because, in fact, it's current practices are, in fact, changed by this policy with respect to what uh, you use the word frivolous, somebody else might use unnecessary uh, uh, exposures. It is our perception now that uh, that our agency, DOE, NRC, and others have used the principle of justification that have required that there be a true benefit for using radioactive material before it is permitted. So currently there is, in fact, uh, some burden of proof, if you will, as to why this use, why this exposure should be allowed. That is our, that and, is our understanding. And that is true. Uh, what you're saying is that is true internationally. That's true sort of across uh, the spectrum of uses here that, that you, uh, you don't, uh, you, you mentioned a toy or a ball or cosmetics have been mentioned, you don't just put that out into the stream of commerce without some meeting of a burden of proof as to why that should be allowed in, in, that, in that stream. Is that what you? That's correct. And this policy, at least in the, in the eyes of, of your staff, suggests that this may be a reversal of that policy and in fact that uh, that showing would not have to be made if in fact it, 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 it came under the, uh, the, the classification of BRC. That's correct. Okay. Number four, uh, you note that the NRC policy establishes a level 1,000 person rims and you say this is 10 times higher than the recommendation of the 100 person rims made by the International Atomic Energy Agency. We do not believe that this establishes appropriate levels of protection you, uh, can you clarify that for us? Well, what you're talking about here is the added exposure to many, many people of the public. That is, if you had, again, a million people exposed uh, to various you would add up the exposure to each of those particular people. And what the Commission policy suggested was that if that, if that total addition, that total cumulative impact was less than a thousand man or person rem, which is the unit by which we measure this, then that would be a candidate for exemption. Uh, our concern there was that the international community had selected a value about a tenth of that, about a hundred person rem per year, again, trying to ensure that the cumulative impacts were going to be very small, that you would not have extensive cumulative impacts from widespread uh, you know, use of the material, widespread dispersal of the material. So from our standpoint that we felt that there uh, mostly would be, uh, you generally should be able to, to consider numbers smaller than 1,000 millirem per year and still have a very implementable policy. It seems that this, uh, uh, this sort of comes to a head with respect to, to EPA in, in, in paragraph six of the, of the document and uh, where you, uh, you state that this means that the NRC uh, below regulatory concern exempted practice could be allowed to contaminate groundwater so the community drinking water uh, now or in the future could ha uh, could have to clean it clean it up in order to meet current EPA uh, criteria I inserted the word criteria but I mean current yes uh, that obviously is a concern that we have EPA has had now for I think about 15 years a, a standard for drinking waters of four millirem per year uh, we're we feel that uh, that the you know the requirement is that the public water supply um, make sure that that level is is provided to the people in a community. So it is their responsibility to ensure that the water is sufficiently clean. So if the water is contaminated, that that community has to draw from, it's the responsibility of the community to clean it up. So we feel it's important that the water doesn't get contaminated. Uh, under a community so they don't have to go about cleaning it up. And the concern is is that if you have a BRC policy of, of 10 millirem per year, you have the possibility that because of, of 
not just one, but multiple exemptions at that level at a landfill or nearby, you might very well contaminate some water supplies to exceed that level. And we would want to ensure that that didn't occur through however this implementation is going to happen at NRC. So on, it, on its face, as you read the policy on its face and recognizing that this is a policy absent regulation, that that, that, that other st step hasn't gone forward, uh, on its face, are you telling this committee that this because of the difference in the numbers and the criteria EPA versus this policy that in fact is concealed this policy would allow uh, uh, for a concentration uh, to an extent that could that, that uh, could con I'm using obviously contingency words here but could contaminate water in excess of EPA standards that 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 constellation could come together Obviously, depending upon how they'd actually license I understand that. to write a regulation, that might not be the case. But on, on the face value, if you have, if you have, if you're allowing an individual source to be exempted at 10 millirem per year, and there could be two, five, ten of these potential things getting into a landfill, you, if you have, if, if that landfill or if where the other materials might be exposed are near a public water supply, you have the possibility. Now, you have attenuating factors of contamination, you, some of the radioactivity might be absorbed in the ground on the way to the, the aquifer. You might have those factors that would diminish it. But that's true of all groundwater contaminants, that's true. right? That's correct. And so as a consequence of that, you know, we can't say for sure that there'd be a problem, but it does appear that there's an issue that needs to be addressed. So let me go back again, just if I might, uh, for my own clarification. So if we go back to, to paragraph two in, in, your, in, the, in this document and we combine that with, uh, uh, with paragraph six, that's kind of telling, is that telling us how you can get to the conclusion that you may have a site that conceivably, depending again on, on how this would be regulated and, and how wide the definitions of practice are, that that's how you get to the conclusion that you can have a site where you can, you can conceivably get into the situation where this federal standard allows for the violation of the EPA's current EPA standard. That's correct. Well, uh, uh, let me thank you for your, uh, 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 for your testimony. I think uh, uh, EPA has raised, uh, the EPA has raised uh, uh, the exact issues that uh, that confront all of our of our communities uh, in terms of uh, the protection of their drinking water, the landfill siting, uh, uh, the questions of monitoring and public knowledge about what is or isn't going to uh, uh, take place with respect to the disposal of this uh, 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 of this uh, of this waste stream, uh, and I appreciate it, Mr. Clark. Uh, Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I, I'd like to ask uh, a question in, case, uh, in regard to your statement on page 5 that EPA has not promulgated criteria for a specific practice in the case of below regulatory concern. Is it important for EPA to do that uh, promptly? Uh, <coughs> frankly, at, uh, at EPA to date, uh, deregulation of radioactive materials or other things has not been one of our highest priorities and as a consequence we have not moved as maybe expeditiously as one might indicate in this direction. What we usually go on things where we're given more specific congressional direction and more specific congressional mandate to do and we have not had a specific congressional mandate in this area to go so we have addressed our priorities more to things we've had court orders or other more specific congressional mandates to implement. So we have been considering a BRC uh, criteria in a, in a more narrow vein that is for one specific practice dealing with low-level waste, and that is being considered at the senior levels of the government now. It would appear to me as a, uh, that it would be important to do that promptly at this point. Uh, Mr. Chairman, may I ask one more question? Sure. Uh, on page 7, uh, you talk about the uh, uh, Commission has great latitude in its ability to limit certain practices to a level of one millirem per year, although it's unclear as to how it will go about defining such practices. Is it, is it, is it, will it be possible to define such practices? Can that be done? Can that be done? 
S certainly, one can define, uh, you know, one kinds of practice they have. I mean, for example, some practices have already been defined and exempted that were talked about earlier, such as smoke detectors, you know, the use and disposal of a smoke detector is defined by them basically as a practice. So you can define practices. The question is, how broadly or how narrowly do you define them? It's a doable exercise. Um, well, is it, it's, it, it, is, is it important to define them narrowly? Yes, it is. It, well, no, I don't think it's the, the more narrow, I think the more narrow the definition is in some cases, the more likelihood you have many, many of them. And as a consequence, that has some potential then for having, you know, the more things that you have deregulated, the more opportunity for multiple exposures to many things that are deregulated. So uh, when, when we believe you've got to take a look at it, you ought to uh, ensure that your practices are more broadly defined. And in fact, the way we've been taking a look at the possibility of a BRC is a broader definition that would cover many different wastes at one time so that we didn't have 10 individual things exempted to some value right. that could be added, but rather a combination of many things that were, that were treated that way. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I just might, we have a vote on Mr. Chairman, but let me ask you a question. Uh, uh, Congressman Atkins raised the, the questions of, of, of the risk, if you will, and of, of, of cancers in his, uh, in his testimony. Uh, how, many, how many cancers would you expect in a population exposed to a collective dose of 1,000 pers and rim, you know? Yeah. Uh, Life. Prob it's probably on the order. You have to keep two things in mind on that. One is the 1,000 person rem, but then how you go about defining the 1,000 person rem. Uh, another thing in the Commission's proposal was to what they call truncate, that is to stop counting exposure at less than 0.1 millirem per year, okay? And let me put that in perspective. We recently, we, we've been doing some regulations, say air emissions around facilities. We typically would calculate the exposure to all people at, say, 50 miles around that facility, okay? So if you did that, if you looked at if you, we would be adding up exposures to millions of people around a potential facility. Now, if you truncated that, if you stopped counting up exposure in individuals at anything less than point millirem per year, you would probably stop at a couple of miles from a facility rather than going out there. So you're going to drop off maybe 50 to 90 percent of the total cumulative exposure. So a thousand person rem itself is approximately uh, five, a half a half a lung can or half a cancer death per year, okay, a half a fatal cancer death per year. However, since you've dropped off 50 to 90 percent, perhaps of the of the total risk there, the number may be larger. Thank you. Uh, the committee is going to break for a uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much for your uh, your testimony. The committee is going to break for a vote, and we'll come back and proceed with the uh, with the next panel. Right? The uh, subcommittee will, uh, will come to uh, come to order. Uh, for the record, let me just say uh, that we have some additional questions that we'll submit in writing uh, for uh, for the EPA uh, uh, to respond to from other members of the committee who were unable to be here this morning. And Congressman Bates of California has asked that a, a, a statement be submitted in the record. And Congressman Tim uh, Tim Johnson. Uh, also ask that a, a uh, statement be submitted uh, to the record. The next panel that, uh, that we'll uh, hear from are representatives of, of some, some of the concerned states. Mr. James T. Gilbreth, who is the uh, Chief Deputy uh, Attorney General, State of Maine. Mr. Thomas Or Ortinger, Orton Ortinger uh, Director of the Illinois Department of Nuclear Safety. And Mr. R. David Myers, uh, Deputy Secretary for Public Liaison, Department of Environmental Resources, State of Pennsylvania. Gentlemen, welcome to the uh, to, to the to the uh, committee. Uh, your printed statements and any supporting documents uh, that uh, you believe are necessary will be made a part of the record in their uh, entirety. And again, it is the uh, practice of uh, this subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it in investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? If you would, if you'd rise, please. Do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? No. Thank you. 
In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives and the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of rules have previously been provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you desire to be represented by counsel? Thank you very much. Mr. Kilberth, we'll start with you. Thank you very much, Chairman Miller. It's a pleasure to be here today. I um, have submitted a written statement, and I won't repeat that. Uh, but what I'd like to do is, is start with the uh, principal concerns of the state of Maine, and that has to do with the preemption question. Um, at the outset, I, what provoked our concern uh, was a letter that was sent from the uh, personal assistant to Chairman Carr to the uh, manager of the state's radiological health program, which uh, basically said uh, that they thought he'd be interested in a uh, legal memorandum, which they enclosed. And that memorandum purported to find that Maine's uh, statute which prohibits any waste determined to be BRC after January 1, 1989, from being disposed of in anything other than a licensed low-level waste facility, uh, was preempted. Now, what's important, I think, to recognize about the preemption question is that it has had a huge impact in the state of Maine. In 1986, the DOE came to Maine with respect to the high level waste facility and essentially said um, that they were going to think about locating a high-level waste facility near Sebago <coughs> Lake, which was the city of Portland's drinking water supply. Uh, and in a situation where the um, geological conditions are that it's bedrock and filled with fractures, uh, that was a proposal that made no sense and really did provoke an incredible <coughs> outcry among the citizens of the state. That was one of the things that led to this legislation, because apart from the techni technical lack of confidence in the federal agencies dealing with these issues, uh, the state on a mass level lost political confidence in the process. Uh, and I think that the, the notion that on the one hand, uh, as the representative from EPA suggested earlier, that states have the responsibility to clean up contaminated water supply but they don't have the authority to regulate what goes into landfills and cause that, can cause that contamination is a ludicrous policy. Uh, it cannot be uh, one that anybody will accept, and it suggests rather strongly that it's time to revisit the whole question of preemption. Uh, I think our view is, and I think I can say with some confidence that I speak for the entire state, uh, that preemption should be abolished altogether. Uh, with all across the board under the Atomic Energy Act, and at a minimum, at least with respect to all waste issues. Um, this comes up in a number of contexts, and I've detailed this more in the, my testimony, but I think that the, it is not, as a policy, uh, sensible to say to states, we can force you to take waste, no matter what the local conditions are, no matter how your people feel. Uh, that is just not the way federal government ought to do business. Um, now, I think that the um, issue of the low-level waste facility gives you some indication of these kinds of issues as well. Maine has adopted probably the most open public process in the country with respect to low-level waste issues. Before a low-level waste facility can be sited, operated, or anything else, it has to go through a series of political hoops. It has to get a two-thirds vote of the municipality it's located in, and it has to be approved by 60 percent of the voters in a state referendum. Um, this is an issue of tremendous concern in the state of Maine. Uh, and because the state is going down the road, as the federal law requires it to do, to develop a low-level waste facility, to now say that 30 percent of the waste stream will suddenly be taken out of that process and can go to local landfills is particularly ludicrous. Um, I think that if you force the state to spend the money to develop a low-level waste facility, you ought to at least allow the state to decide what's going to go there. Um, I won't repeat, uh, in large part because I'm not qualified to, the uh, technical evidence you've, you've heard and I'm sure you'll hear more of. 
but, but I do want to say that the context in which this debate about what is or isn't, quote, below regulatory concern, close quote, uh, takes place against a backdrop where I think it is generally agreed scientifically that there is no safe level of exposure. Uh, now, you've heard from uh, the NRC, at least in its policy, that they're willing to say 10 millirem is below regulatory concern. EPA is talking about four. Uh, other people talk about one. It doesn't seem to make any sense, given that scientific debate, to not only ad adopt a policy that picks the high end of the debate, but to also say, states, you have to take whatever we do. Uh, this is just not a policy that makes any sense. I would say that we are prepared to litigate with the NRC, if that's who it is, over the, whether our statute is preempted. But on the whole, it seems to me it makes much better sense for Congress to exercise some leadership and eliminate these case-by-case -case fights over preemption, uh, particularly in the waste area, and to adopt the policy that the federal government has in most other sensitive environmental areas, and that is the federal government should set minimum standards and the state should be free, depending on local conditions and requirements, to enact more stringent requirements. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Ortinger. <clears throat> uh, thank you for the opportunity to uh, comment on the NRC's policy statement of June 27, 1990. Illinois concern regarding this concept of designating certain radioactive materials as below regulatory concern, or BRCs, is not new. Almost two years ago, learning about the U U.S. Environmental Protection Agency having submitted a proposal on BRC rule uh, to the Office of Management and Budget, Illinois expressed its concerns then over this concept. And as recently as December of 1989 and February of 1990, we wrote the NRC expressing again our concern for proposals for exempting certain practices and radioactive materials. Our concern now is then is the adoption of a BRC standard which would allow disposal of low-level radioactive waste in facilities not specifically designed and licensed to receive these materials. We believe it would interfere with the efforts of the states and regional compacts to develop their programs for disposal of low-level waste. Further, we fear that the policy will allow significant quantities of radioactive waste to be disposed of in sanitary landfills, which will make siting and development of new solid waste disposal facilities impossible. However, our most serious concern with the NRC's final policy statement is that the NRC has indicated that they intend to make these rulemakings, which they will implement at the BRC policy items of, com items of compatibility, thereby eliminating the regulatory authority of the states to prohibit unrestricted disposal and revoking the authority of the states and regional compacts to determine how best to manage disposal of low-level radioactive waste. There is ample legislative history, we believe, to support the view that states are not prohibited from imposing more stringent standards. Certainly, legislative history does not indicate that Congress shares NRC's concern that some states might reduce the risks to public and the environment by adapting regulations that are more stringent than NRC's. The states are making progress towards fulfilling their responsibilities under the Policy Act to provide disposal capacity for low-level radioactive waste. It has become increasingly more apparent that we need to do more to demonstrate that the, these proposals for handling this waste are adequate to protect public health and safety. The states have found that it is necessary that, to assure the, that the risks to its citizens as a result of low-level waste disposal have been minimized. In Illinois, this has meant that the, that the facility being developed for the Central Midwest Compact is to employ the use of engineered barriers, even though the NRC has determined that shallow land burial is adequate. However, progress in Illinois and other states will be thwarted if states do not have the latitude to address public concerns regarding health and safety. If, as a result of the BRC determinations, the states are prohibited from excluding radioactive waste from solid waste treatment and disposal facilities, Illinois believes that it will be impossible to site new solid waste facilities. In 1987, our Environmental Protection Agency predicted that our existing landfills would be exhausted by 1992. 
thanks to vigorous recycling programs, these estimates have been raised to 1995. However, since 1985, only one facility has been put into service in the state, even without the threat of radioactive materials. It is becoming extremely difficult to site new landfills. If the state cannot prohibit certain ways from being disposed of, siting new landfills will be virtually impossible. And of, of deep concern to myself and the agency, and probably the most reprehensible aspect of the BRC policy statement, is that the NRC did not make any real effort to seek public comment. In 1988, the NRC did publish the advance notice of proposed statement and meeting, which identified some elements of a policy that the NRC was considering and invited preliminary views concerning a policy for exemption. But prior to issuing the final policy statement, NRC did not publish a notice of proposed policy statement or even distribute a draft version of this policy for public scrutiny and thereby excluding us from further comment. Illinois vehemently objects to the NRC's policy statement. The Commission has done far more than lay the groundwork for making future decisions regarding appropriateness of exempting radioactive materials from regulatory control. With only the sheerest camouflage, the Commission has laid the groundwork for making its future, future exemption decisions <coughs> binding on the states and the compacts. By this action, the NRC has attempted to usurp the rights of the states to independently determine how to fulfill their responsibilities under the Policy Act. Furthermore, the NRC has attempted to tie the hands of the state that wish to be responsive to the demands of their citizens that low-level waste be disposed of in the safest manner feasible. Thank you. Thank you. Mark. Mr. Chairman, I want to thank you and the members of the committee for the opportunity to, to appear before you today to discuss Pennsylvania's concerns regarding the nuclear regulatory's policy, exempting certain radioactive material from the NRC's regulatory control. It is my understanding that the focus of this hearing is the impact that the NRC's below regulatory concern policy will have on states electing to enact legislation or implement regulations to prohibit the diversion of low-level radioactive waste from licensed disposal facilities. As you know, designating certain radioactive waste as below regulatory concern could have significant ramifications. It could affect the ability of states to establish the low-level radioactive waste disposal capacity required under federal law. It could jeopardize the siting of waste facilities to handle solid waste. It could lead to the recycling of radioactive materials into consumer products, and it could possibly affect the public health and safety. As a matter of public policy, Pennsylvania cannot support any BRC policy or BRC waste stream designation, which we believe poses an undue risk to the public health and safety or to the environment. We believe this policy may pose just such a risk. Equally important, the regulated community within our state, the elected public officials of our state, and the general public at large have clearly said that they do not support diverting low-level radioactive waste from licensed disposal facilities. On July 11th of this year, Pennsylvania Governor Robert Casey signed into law Act 107, the Low-Level Radioactive Waste Disposal Regional Facility Act. Section 104 of this act mandates that all waste defined as low-level radioactive waste as of January 1st, 1989, shall be disposed at a licensed facility. This statutory authority compels Pennsylvania to limit the implementation of the NRC's BRC policy as it would apply to low-level waste generated or disposed within our state. During the signing of Act 107, Governor Casey declared that, quote, this provision makes it clear that the Commonwealth does not want any type of radioactive waste dis deposited in landfills or other disposal areas not specifically licensed or designed for radioactive materials. Congress has encouraged interstate compacts to operate regional facilities for the management and disposal of low-level radioactive waste. As adopted by Congress in the four member states, the Appalachian State's Low-Level Radioactive Waste Compact prohibits the disposal of any low-level waste within the region unless authorized by the Compact Commission. Since the BRC waste stream would still be considered low-level radioactive waste, although no longer subject to regulation by the NRC, we believe that the compact and the host state must necessarily retain authority over disposal of low-level radioactive waste in the Appalachian State's compact region. Our compact requires that disposal be consistent with host state laws. Our intent is clear. 
Waste which is currently considered low-level radioactive waste will be disposed in, license, in a licensed facility whether or not it is below regulatory concern. We are concerned, however, that the NRC may determine that Act 107 is incompatible with their regulatory program, thereby preventing the Commonwealth from assuming full agreement state status. We anticipate that no later than the third quarter of 1993, Pennsylvania will file with the NRC an application for full agreement state status which would transfer regulatory authority to the Commonwealth. Should the NRC interpret compatibility to require states to accept their BRC policy, it would either effectively void a statute enacted by our General Assembly to protect the public health and safety or cause us to rethink our interest in agreement state status. We question whether the Congress intended the NRC to require agreement, state, ag agreement states to adopt its BRC policy as a condition of becoming an agreement state. We believe that the NRC's exemption of certain radioactive material from regulatory control by the NRC does not prohibit the Commonwealth from regulating such material, nor should the regulation of waste by the Commonwealth affect our request for agreement state status. We do not believe that Congress, in adopting either the Low-Level Radioactive Waste Policy Act or in accepting the Appalachian State's Low-Level Radioactive Waste Compact, intended to circumscribe our ability to provide more protection to our public. Clearly, the denial of agreement state status solely because we have set more stringent low-level radioactive waste requirements would be a gross miscarriage of justice, especially when our state is making a good faith effort to comply with the federal law and merely wants to provide additional assurances to protect our people's public health and safety. Historically, state and local governments have been responsible for solid waste disposal. The BRC policy will erode state and local jurisdiction in this area. Where states have clear authority over solid waste, we believe that they should have the authority to set standards so long as they are not weaker than federal requirements. We believe that the BRC policy will erode public confidence in our efforts to site a, both a low-level radioactive waste facility and will undermine our ability to address the solid waste management needs of our Commonwealth. We in Pennsylvania are painfully aware of the need for diligence in handling low-level radioactive waste. The accident at Three Mile Island is permanently etched in the minds of most Pennsylvanians. More recently, we have pressed for and won major concessions to allow our state greater jurisdiction over the operations of the Peach Bottom Nuclear Facility, which suffered significant violations of sound operating procedures. We are serious about nuclear safety in Pennsylvania. I thank you for the opportunity to provide testimony on the NRC's below <coughs> regulatory concern policy. And as with the other members, I'm ready to answer questions. <clears throat> Thank you very much for your uh, for your testimony to all three of you, uh, Ms. Myers. Uh, you you make the very specific case uh, of your concern. I, I guess the, the concern of your state that that your uh, uh, the act recently signed by Governor Casey 107 that at some point this uh, this runs head on into this uh, uh, into this policy uh, should should preemption continue to be a part uh, of this policy. Uh, what's the situation in, in your other two states with respect to specific statutory language and, and your regulation of, of this kind of waste? Uh, well, in Maine, the, uh, I've attached a copy of our statute to my testimony, uh, Chairman Miller, and it provides, uh, uh, I think Pennsylvania probably has the identical statute, it provides that no uh, uh, low-level waste uh, classified as such before January 1, 1989 <coughs> if subsequently determined to be below regulatory concern, can be disposed of. So, in effect, you have an outright prohibition also. Outright prohibition, absolutely. By, 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 the, uh, by the dating of it. Yes, and it was, that was enacted, actually, in uh, the spring of 1989 and signed by the governor in, I think, June of 1989. In Illinois? <clears throat> it would be <clears throat> my uh, suspicion that when our legislature returns in November, based on the negotiations they're attempting now to uh, have a better program to site landfills, we will be passing very similar legislation. You, am I correct in my understanding that there was a joint resolution or some sense of the legislature that was, was passed this last session? And the question is now converting that to a statute. Yes. But you do not yet have uh, a statute on the books that, that runs head on into this, into no. this policy. Uh, the, uh, in, in your discussions, the extent to which you might have had them with, with, the, uh, 
uh, with the NRC. Uh, have you received any indication uh, that preemption will not be a part of this policy? Um, I, the only thing I can tell you about that, Chairman Miller, is that uh, there apparently about a year ago was a discussion between some staff members of the NRC and some of the uh, uh, Division of Health Engineering people in which uh, the NRC said that for the moment they weren't going to directly challenge our statute. Uh, I wouldn't take that to mean that they were never going to challenge the statute. And I took the uh, fact that they chose to send around a memo which expressly says they believe there's preemption uh, to be that that is their view. Uh, they sent that around, uh, incidentally, the month before they adopted the DRC policy. Any other indications that, that I'm trying to sort out the sort of the uh, you know what what are what are the real issues and the uh, and, and the speculative issues? It seem it appears uh, from what you have said and, and and what other critics of this policy have said that this policy couldn't survive without preemption. That this would not be one warmly and voluntarily embraced within the uh, within the states. Well, as an agreement state. Um, I believe that they will interpret that for strict compatibility, whatever BRC they uh, arrive at. I think in Maine it's fair to say that, that uh, absent a, a court decision that our statute is preempted, the state would not voluntarily go along with the BRC policy. Let, let me raise that, that <clears throat> point because I guess one of the concerns would be that's been expressed to me by, by people in the area that I represent. Uh, uh, attorneys that have been involved in this, and that is that uh, at the moment we have a, a policy and uh, it, it, it envisions apparently, and the NRC can clarify this, but it, it seems to on its face clearly envision the preemption of, of states. Uh, we have some expressions uh, that I hope to be able to clear up as to whether or not this policy will be used or not used, whether it's sort of a standby policy, what have you. But, it, but uh, later, uh, uh, this may very well be followed up by regulations. And it may be that there is no challenge to the, uh, to the main statute in your case uh, or in the Pennsylvania case where you have one on the books. But the policy starts to age. And then down the road, over a period of time, you then do engage in a, in a challenge because somebody in Maine decides this is how they want to dispose of, of, of the waste or somebody in Pennsylvania makes that determination. And it seems to me that you, you almost get lulled into this debate of, well, this probably really won't be used, this is for discussions, what have you, and, and, and sooner or later we have on the books a policy that, that, uh, that mandates preemption. And I think that's the concern of Senator Mitchell and, and, and myself and others is that uh, the notion, the downplaying of this policy now by the industry who was clearly a handmaiden in trying to get it formulated but now has decided to, to divorce themselves to some extent from it and others, the downplaying of it still leaves it on the books, leaves it a policy and may even uh, down the road leave regulations on the book and it's not up to this administration or anybody else. It's, it's, it's triggered in effect by a petition to use this policy and all of a sudden now we have federal preemption on the, on the books. Uh, that would is sort of my concern about treating this lightly or speculative in, in, uh, in, in nature, is, is, is that we will eventually end up, if, if it's not dealt with in, uh, at some point in a decisive fashion, either by the NRC or by the, uh, by the Congress, that we will end up with a federal policy on the books that, uh, that someday uh, uh, your states are going to have to, my state's going to have to contend with. Well, I, I think, Chairman Miller, from our point of view, uh, that, that concern is, is a, a very real one, and, and you're absolutely right. And we are hoping that Congress will take the lead and, and address it, because the alternative to an express statutory provision uh, ab ab abandoning the policy of preemption, uh, it seems to me, is exactly what you said. That is, the policy will be followed, regulations will be adopted, some generator will then, in reliance on the, po the regulations, attempt to dispose of BRC waste in a way that's in conflict with the statute, at which point we would go to court. But one of the problems, obviously, yeah. is you have a lot of uncertainty about that, and it's far down the road, and it's far preferable to get that resolved up front before any of it happens. 
I couldn't agree more. Congressman Clark? Uh, no further questions. On the, uh, let me ask you just uh, to the extent that you're, uh, you're qualified to comment. I assume that in, in, your, in your states, again, you touched upon it in, in your testimonies, that the, this conflict that seems to be on, on the siting of landfills uh, that, that's going on all over the, uh, the country, uh, that this is not a helpful policy in, in, that, uh, in that debate in your, in your communities, <laughs> I'm put it politely, I guess. No, absolutely not. Uh, this sort of, it is difficult in our state, and I would imagine in the other states, as Congressman Rahal explained as well, it's difficult in, in most states to cite uh, solid waste disposal facilities. The <coughs> public is gravely concerned about those and the safety and the adequacy of those solutions and diverting an additional waste stream that the public is also equally or maybe even more, more concerned about uh, is going to make that much more difficult task. In Illinois, we have in both our low level act and in the uh, landfill act a requirement for local option which allows the county or a city within a mile and a half of a proposed site to have final vote on whether or not they're cited. And since 1981, in terms of landfills, we've only cited five and one in the last five years. And uh, interestingly enough, uh, approximately two, three weeks ago, we received a call while they were anticipating this issuance of this policy statement and a, and a <coughs> county board member, and I don't know if it was tongue in cheek, asked if they accepted the low level site, if we would then consider leg legislation to exempt them from accepting any landfills. Uh, they thought it would be much safer going about it in that route. Yeah, I'm, I'm led to believe that in some states, maybe, maybe even uh, Illinois, where you don't have uh, a specific statute addressing this, that some of the uh, operators are now signing uh, good neighbor agreements where they say they will uh, uh, not knowingly accept any, uh, uh, any radioactive waste, low-level waste or BRC waste or what have you. Are you, are you aware of that? They are at least making the statement publicly and not signing statements. I guess that's that operator's right. I just don't know how that plays into this discussion, whether that has any force and effect against, uh, against uh, 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 preemption or the ability to, uh, uh, to license that, uh, uh, that facility. It's, it's an interesting agreement that he will not knowingly uh, take it. Uh, that doesn't suggest that somebody won't knowingly put it there. Uh, there's a difference uh, between those two. Uh, but is that true in Illinois? Is it that there have been there's some of those? They have made public statements to that. I'm not aware of any written. This is in the debate over siting? Yes. In my district, when you take all the public statements they've made, there won't be anything going into the landfill. I don't know why the hell they'd want it, but uh, uh, in any case. Well, thank you very much. Let me just uh, make a suggestion. Uh, uh, this is obviously one of those issues that, that uh, uh, seriously impacts the uh, uh, the operations uh, within the, within the various states, and uh, uh, I would hope at some point that uh, uh, that the various associations of the attorney generals or the governors or uh, environmental officers and others would take a look at this policy uh, and uh, and make uh, uh, their 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 findings known to the uh, to the Congress because I think it will be helpful. Uh, in this debate if this policy is to go forward as it's currently printed on its face. So thank you very much for your, uh, your you. testimony and your, your time this morning. The next panel will be made up of uh, members and commissioners of the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission, Chairman Mr. Kenneth Carr, Commissioner James R. Curtis, Commissioner Kenneth C. Rogers, and Commissioner Forrest Rimmick. Welcome to the, uh, to the committee. Uh, gentlemen, your uh, your entire statement will be placed in the uh, in the uh, in the record in its entirety, and any supporting documents that you believe to be uh, to be necessary. It, again, let me state that it is the uh, practice uh, of this subcommittee to swear all witnesses who appear before it at investigative hearings. Do you have any objections to being sworn? If you'd please stand, raise your right hand. Do you solemnly? 
solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. In order to inform you of your rights as a witness before the committee and the limitations on the authority of the subcommittee, the rules of the House of Representatives of the and of the committee are on the table in front of you. Both sets of rules have previously been provided to you. You are advised of your right to counsel. The role of counsel would be to advise you of your constitutional rights. Do you have any desire to be represented by counsel? Well, we have our general counsel with us today. Fine, sir. thank you. Uh, Chairman Carr, we'll begin with you. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. At the outset, let me uh, congratulate you on holding this hearing. From what I've heard of uh, misinformation and misunderstanding present today, I think it's time we said, shed some light on this policy, so I appreciate the opportunity. I hate to raise this point, but the last time the NRC put out a booklet called Shedding Light, they got into a great deal of trouble, but we won't go. It was must before your before, time. Must have been before my watch. <laughs> it was long. Uh, Mr. Chairman and members of the subcommittee, we welcome the opportunity to appear before you today to discuss the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's policy on below regulatory concern. Also with us are the Executive Director for Operations, Mr. James Taylor, the General Counsel, Mr. William Parler, and the Director of the Office of Nuclear Material Safety and Safeguards, Mr. Robert Bernero. We have a brief opening statement. With your permission, we request that our full testimony be included in the record. Not objection. Our testimony will describe the need for the policy, the principal benefits, the development of the policy, and the plans for its implementation. We are confident that NRC's implementation of the policy will protect the public health and safety and the environment. It is NRC's responsibility to determine the appropriate levels of safety that we require of our licensees in the use of radioactive materials. That is why we developed the policy on Below Regulatory Concern, or BRC. This policy will provide the basis for our decisions on how safe is safe enough in the use and cleanup of radioactive materials. The BRC policy will enable us to consider this question in the context of our overall responsibilities in proceedings open to all interested members of the public and cognizant state and federal agencies. Last year, when I appeared before the House Government Operations Subcommittee on, in, on Environment, Energy, and Natural Resources, Subcommittee Chairman Mike Sinar asked why it had taken the federal government so long to establish safe and consistent levels for the cleanup of contaminated nuclear sites across the country. I told him I had no excuse for the past, but one of NRC's highest priorities would be to establish safe levels of cleanup for existing and future sites. Additionally, the need for a consistent approach to making exemption decisions was recognized by the Congress when it passed Section 10 of the Low-Level Radioactive Waste Policy Amendments Act of 1985. The Act directed NRC to develop standards and procedures for exempting from regulation certain radioactive waste streams which are so low in radioactive concentrations that they are, to quote the statute, below regulatory concern. For the past 30 years, the NRC and its predecessor agency have made similar decisions to exempt such very low levels of radioactive material on a case-by-case -case basis under authority granted by the Atomic Energy Act. Such case-by-case -case exemption decisions have resulted in differing levels of protection for the public. The BRC policy now provides a framework to ensure a consistent level of safety in making future exemption decisions. Under the BRC policy, an exemption granted by the NRC would permit the transfer of very small amounts of slightly radioactive materials from a regulated to an unregulated status. It is important to note that this transfer would permit the release of only very low levels of radiation, such as those most of us encounter in the use of smoke detectors in our homes today. These levels are very small relative to natural background radiation. Implementation of the BRC policy will benefit the nation. Implementation of the policy will benefit the public living in areas around contaminated nuclear sites by establishing consistent cleanup levels for restoring these sites to conditions suitable for release. These cleanup levels must be established so that funding requirements can be accurately determined. This is an important step towards ensuring that sufficient funding will be set aside 
for the eventual cleanup of all commercial nuclear facilities. By requiring timely, consistent cleanup of these sites, the environment will be protected. For consumer products such as smoke detectors, the public will benefit by knowing every product that is exempted will be safe for use and that costs will not be needlessly inflated because of excessive regulatory requirements. Implementation of the BRC policy will also benefit the public in the long term by allowing NRC, our agreement states, and our licensees to focus on the control of more significant risk to the public. For example, hospitals and research institutions could devote money saved from safe yet more efficient waste management practices to improving health care and the quality of life. Finally, implementation of the BRC policy will benefit the public by providing a unified and clearly defined approach for protecting the public and the environment in, con in conjunction with NRC's revised rule on radiation protection, 10 CFR Part 20, which will be published shortly. When the Commission was considering what levels of radiation should be defined as below regulatory concern, we assessed both the level and variation of natural background doses and the capabilities of current technology to monitor and, access and assess radiation doses. Natural background radiation, for example, varies with time and location. In Washington, D.C., natural background <coughs> radiation, excluding radon, results in doses to individuals of about 90 millirem per year, while in Denver, Colorado, the value is about 160 millirem per year. Even here on Capitol Hill, background radiation varies in hundreds of millirem from building to building. In addition, radon exposure contributes an average additional dose of 200 millirem per person per year to the U.S. population. Naturally occurring radioactive material in our own bodies contributes about 40 millirem per person per year. The National Council on Radiation Protection and Measurements estimates that the average American is exposed to about 300 millirem per year from natural background radiation, and this magnitude varies considerably as a result of location, lifestyle, and other personal characteristics. These variations in routine exposure are commonly accepted by the public without significant efforts to reduce them. Our BRC policy is based on assessments of risk that are consistent with the recommendations by the National Research Council's Committee on the Biological Effects of Ionizing Radiation, BIR-5. The United Nations Scientific Committee on the Effects of Atomic Radiation and other expert bodies. The Commission believes the BRC dose criteria provide an adequate margin of safety since, as the Beer 5 Committee concludes, and I quote, studies of populations chronically exposed to low-level radiation, such as those residing in regions of elevated natural background radiation, have not shown consistent or conclusive evidence of an associated increase in the risk of cancer. The individual BRC dose criteria are tens to hundreds of times less than these levels. The development of the BRC policy has been a long and challenging task for this agency. There have been many different views expressed on BRC issues by the NRC, staff, other federal agency, and by some states. We have welcomed these points of view. Indeed, we endeavored to ensure that the policy statement process was an open one and that all involved had the opportunity to express their views. The Commission reached its decision on the policy by selecting preferred solutions from a range of possible options provided by the NRC staff. These decisions were made based on the Commission's technical analysis of the issues associated with regulatory exemptions, legal interpretation of governing legislation, and regulatory experience in approving exemptions since the inception of civilian uses of nuclear materials in the 1950s. During development of the BRC policy statement, the Commission provided a variety of forums for public comment, including an international conference and a number of public meetings on the development and content of the BRC policy. Although some groups criticized the policy, the Health Physics Society and others strongly endorsed it. As with any policy initiative, 
The success of our policy depends largely on its understanding and acceptance by the public. In the next few months, the NRC staff will hold public meetings in each of the NRC's five regions around the country to explain the below regulatory concern policy statement and answer questions. Local and state governments, licensees, and members of the public are invited to attend these meetings to ensure that we have addressed their concerns about public health and safety and to understand how we plan to implement this program. The dates and locations have been noticed in the Federal Register and will be sent to local media and other interested individuals. I want to clarify some common misperceptions I've heard about the Commission's BRC policy. First, the policy is not self-implementing. It is not a regulation. <coughs> NRC rulemakings and licensing actions over the next several years will be required to implement the policy. New NRC regulations implementing the below regulatory concern policy will be established only after soliciting and considering public comments on proposed exemptions. Consistent with this point, the policy statement does not by itself require agreement states to adopt the dose criteria in the policy. Under the Atomic Energy Act, Congress intended that there be uniformity between the NRC and agreement states on basic radiation protection standards. The Commission will address the issue of compatibility between federal and state requirements in the individual rulemakings needed to implement the policy. NRC regulations exempting BRC waste will not affect the authority of state or local agencies to regulate BRC waste for purposes other than radiation protection. Second, exempted materials will not be uncontrolled. Before any material is transferred to an exempt status, those applying for such exemptions will be required to satisfy appropriate constraints. The NRC will establish the needed constraints through rulemaking proceedings or licensing actions, which include a comprehensive technical analysis by our qualified professionals, health physicists, nuclear engineers, and licensing specialists of the potential effects of the proposed exempted practice. Third, the policy is not intended to discourage good health physics practices or the application of improved technology for radiation protection. Such improved technology will be invaluable in the decontamination and decommissioning of commercial nuclear facilities. <coughs> Fourth, the policy will not permit excessive doses to the public as a result of multiple practices or from the accumulation of exempted waste at a single facility, such as a landfill, landfill or an incinerator. In reviewing and approving exemptions, the Commission will ensure that the potential exposure from any single practice is small and that the total impact on public health and safety of all practices is acceptably low. I want to stress that the NRC will continue to analyze and scrutinize each proposed exemption to ensure that any radiation doses will be within the policy's criteria. The public and the environment will remain properly protected. The NRC will regulate, inspect, and enforce requirements governing the production of exempt material up to and including the point of exemption. The Commission will also periodically evaluate the effectiveness of this policy. Each of us probably doesn't realize that when we dispose of our smoke detectors or choose to take a cross-country flight, we are already making decisions about radiation exposure that the NRC has characterized as below regulatory concern. No human endeavor involves a zero level of risk. The levels of radiation exposure we're talking about here, while not zero, are exceedingly small. They represent a correspondingly small level of risk. Members of the public must assess the activities and risks involved in their everyday lives and make informed decisions about those risks they are willing to spend their own dollars on to reduce. These are the kinds of decisions we face every day at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission in protecting the American public and in doing our best to wisely spend the taxpayers' dollars to help ensure safety. The NRC is dedicated to the safety of the American public.
This policy will ensure the continued protection of the health and safety of all members of the public. This concludes our statement. We shall be pleased to respond to any questions that you and the subcommittee might have. But before I do that, I would like to respond to a few of the comments made by previous uh, testifiers. With respect to the letter that the main gentleman quoted, uh, I attended a conference on BRC in Florida earlier this year. Uh, the representative from Maine who was there and I discussed that letter that had appeared at the NRC from somewhere. It was an attorney's opinion. Uh, he asked me if I would send him a copy. I said I would. I handed it to my secretary who said she had sent it to him. She did. Uh, that's the total as far as I'm concerned of the distribution of that so-called uh, uh, congressional or some kind of a decision on the constitutionality of the main law. The idea that anything we do as a result of the policy statement that would violate federal standards, uh, we are required to comply with federal standards. Uh, one of the reasons we're putting the policy statement out is we have had an absence of federal standards in this area. Uh, the landfill problem, uh, we have existing exemptions on the book, and I think you have a list of those. We have three pages of existing exemptions. Uh, those are already going into landfills, I presume. Uh, I'm not aware of any major problem that they have caused or any problem as far as that goes. Uh, the impact on low-level waste sites, there's nothing in the policy that would impact low-level waste sites. No exemptions have been applied for, uh, nor am I aware of any that are about to come in as far as low-level waste is concerned. Uh, timing. Uh, my opinion on timing of this policy is it's about 30 years overdue. Uh, we needed to get a consistent policy in place. We've been handling these things on a case-by-case -case basis. We're trying to get some order out of chaos, in my opinion, that has existed in making exemption decisions. And as far as your comment about the industry being the handmaiden in this policy, let me assure you that the industry has had no influence on this commission in this policy whatsoever. And with those comments, I stand ready to ask que answer questions. Could you, uh, as, I, as I read your statement, uh, Ms. Carr, uh, the suggestion is in, in in terms of the basis for this uh, for this policy, is that uh, one that you have a a mandate uh, to do this under the 1985 uh, Act, uh, as you say, the Act directed the NRC to develop standards and procedures for exempting from regulation certain radioactive waste streams, which are so low in radioactive concentrations that they are, to quote the statute, below regulatory concern, and. Uh, I guess that's part of the debate here as to whether or not you arrived at a, a criteria and a conclusion uh, uh, that, that that is inconsistent with the statute. We've, we've heard from EPA, we've heard from others have suggested that uh, the standard is in fact too high, that it is not so low as to, to, uh, uh, to qualify uh, in, this, in this case. Well, I think generally, uh, yes, you're right. In one of the things obviously we're trying to comply with is the law and so, but the, the argument has been for that last two or three years, everybody agrees a BRC is a good idea. I understand uh, that. Most of the argument is over the numbers. Uh, yeah, I would suspect that it would be. And if we wait until everybody in the international and national community is agree on, in agreement on the numbers, there will never be a BRC policy. So we're just going to plunge ahead. Uh, we set a number which we believe to be adequate from a health and safety standpoint. We've arrived at that number and we believe it to be uh, defensible. There is, there is no technical evidence presented anywhere by anybody that says that our numbers aren't adequate to protect the health and safety of the public. And when you argue about one, four, ten, and then realize you're multiplying it by tens to the something in possible risk, uh, th those numbers are orders of magnitude. Uh, and we have picked an order of magnitude 1 and 10. 
Uh, and we think that, you know, a four, a few, uh, scientifically, you can't argue that one number is more uh, hazardous than the other one. All the deaths that are predicted from these so-called risk numbers are hypothetical deaths. Uh, there is a, in the, in the discussion on a thousand rem for the collective dose, uh, the U.S. Uh, U.S. Sincere has said that if you're looking at collective doses less <coughs> than 10,000 uh, rem, man rem, then there is it's hard to determine whether there'll be any deaths or not. And we're a ten, order of 10 below that. So we feel that we've picked a, a reasonable number. Without characterizing your remarks, I mean, I would, I, I, I'm concerned that you make light of, of, of serious scientific debate. I suspect that uh, any witness could sit in front of this panel and argue uh, about hypothetical deaths, whether it's from, uh, from benzene or from radioactivity or from any other uh, material that uh, we've come over the last 25 years to consider uh, uh, possibly toxic uh, when introduced to, uh, uh, to the human environment. Uh, and we must, by, by nature of the science, it would seem to me, and to public policy to make some determinations about those hypothetical deaths. So. You, you, we're, I don't quite understand the nature of the remarks you just made. You're suggesting that, that the underlying science really isn't worth a damn, so you can just go pick a few, four, one, ten, or whatever you want, because you can do that willy-nilly? Because there's, there's obviously, uh, as we've heard from this morning and other documentation, within this debate, there seems to be a number of serious scientists uh, some representing other national bodies, some representing their own, their own credentials that suggest that this is a serious debate and the outcome is serious and, and uh, the, the, the deliberations uh, ought to be in fact deliberate over this. Uh, I, mean, I appreciate your impatience, but impatience isn't policy. No, I understand that, but, but what we're talking about is very low levels of radiation. The data that exists I understand is, that. is on higher levels. Uh, the Beer 5 committee, uh, when they're talking about low-level radiation, they're talking about 10 rem, not 10 millirem. Uh, so it, it all I depends. That they also had the conclusion, if I remember the press reports, they also, if they're accurate, had the conclusions about no safe dosage, that they weren't prepared to embrace the fact that there was a, that there was a safe dosage. But they Isn't were that also, correct? But they also said they weren't prepared to say there would be any risk at all from lower levels of radiation. I understand. And so it is, everybody agrees but there's, but a, I mean, there's that, a high that, degree Is that not or is it, is it or is it not a serious debate? Is that a serious scientific, should we take that debate seriously or should we, should we disregard it and decide to pick a number? Oh, I don't think it's, it's a debate at all. I think people are trying to come up with a number. What they're missing is any data. And so they're extrapolating high levels under a theory that is the linear no threshold hypothesis. It says if, if any radiation will kill you, then every radiation must and be bad. And you arrived at your number how? If they don't have any data, what's your data? Um, my data so far is natural radiation around us, as we explained in our statement, is in the order of 350 millirem right. per year. Therefore, we believe that orders of one, four, or ten on top of that, which are no more than maybe a transcontinental flight or a move from maybe here to Denver, are orders of magnitude that we should consider below regulatory concern. And that is based, for those who disagree with you, you say there is no data for that disagreement. But what is the data on which you base that decision? I just said, that's what natural background turns out to be about 350. We're down in the levels of one or 10. So we're well below the natural things that you're exposed to every day, especially sitting in this building. And recognizing, I, I, we, we've known for a considerable period of time that there is, quote, natural uh, background radiation in, in society. Uh, the policy has been uh, that there should not be the introduction of exposure to additional radiation unless there is, is some justifiable societal benefit. Is that not correct? Has that not been the policy more or less since the middle 60s? Or We certainly before? don't intend to irradiate people for no reason at all. That's correct. 
That's the policy. That has been the policy in the past. Is that not correct? Yes, sir. That you had to, you had to have a showing of why uh, oh. you should be allowed to introduce this exposure into society. I don't want to leave you with the opinion that we didn't take the, uh, the opinions of these international and scientific bodies into effect. We did. And I don't think we're in disagreement with any of them. Uh, in general principle, we agree with them. We do disagree on maybe the numbers, but there is, they disagree with each other on the numbers, so I guess we're just another body that disagrees, but uh, in general principle, we're all in agreement and we think we've complied with the general international standards. And but in the reverse, in the, I understand that, in the reversal of, the, of, of what I, I'm led to believe was current policy up until... Uh, oh, uh, you're, you're talking uh, justification? Yes, justification. Yeah. That in fact there was a policy of justification. In uh, the reversal of that policy, the suggestion that there will be uh, 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 a, a level, as you say, that is so low... Well, I don't... That it can be below regulatory... Yeah. Or, or, I don't think we, we reversed that policy. Uh, there will be judgment made in every one of these exemption decisions by all of us. The thing that we've reversed is whether this five or four man commission now, but a five man commission should take it upon themselves to decide what the public ought to have if they want it. Uh, we okay, have, now who will make that decision under the new we policy? Think the, we think the, guy, the public ought to make the demand, the applicant ought to defend it as to why it's necessary and why it's desirable. Depends it where? I beg your pardon? Defends, defends it where? Where's the applicant defense? He has to apply to us for an exemption. Okay. And, but uh, we have made exemption decisions uh, all through the history of this organization. What we're trying to do now is to put that on a consistent basis. So where are the savings? Well, there may not be any savings. To us, we're going to have to work. We're going to have to, it'll probably add a little bit to us because we're going to do things. We have to go back and review those decisions we've made on those three pages. Uh, what the savings we hope will be will ultimately come, hopefully, in hospitals. Much was heard today about waste disposal. <coughs> It doesn't make any difference to me personally if the utilities never apply to put, put their low-level waste into one, to get an exemption for their low-level waste. We need this policy to be able to decide how, cl how clean is clean enough to walk away from contaminated sites and turn them over for public use. Right now we've got 40 sites out there we're trying to clean up, some of them in your state, some of them in Pennsylvania, some of them all around the country. And we've got to know what level is adequate so we can require those people to put enough money aside. When we do decommission these sites, we need that kind of a decision. So if the EPA comes out with their policy, we will, I mean, with their criteria, we abide by that. In the absence of them coming out by their criteria, we have had to do something to get this on the books. So we have made that decision. And this is only a policy statement. I must admit, every time some, <coughs> before anything happens as a result of this statement, somebody has to apply for an exemption, and then we have to make a rule or... You understand that, I'm sure. In the... Uh, you, you cite on page three that this is an important step toward ensuring that sufficient funding will be set aside for the eventual cleanup of all commercial nuclear facilities. Uh, is it your expectation that the, the DOE will, will use this policy? Uh, in my state, I guess the closest one to me would be Lawrence Livermore that has uh, uh, apparently uh, a series of, of different problems with respect to, uh, to waste, uh, some of which are, are, are radioactive apparently. Is this, is this a means by which uh, we can change the disposal of, of that waste? I don't know what uh, Lawrence Livermore might apply for. If Lawrence Livermore has a contaminated site and they want to clean it up and say, we want that site now to be no longer contaminated and open for the public, then this is what we would use the criteria for to go in and determine whether that was site was adequately cleaned or not. And we would require anybody with a contaminated site to lay aside monies to clean that site up. Uh, which, to, which would include the disposal of, of some of this waste, right. whatever, the, whatever the site is. Yeah, yeah they, my staff has just reminded me, Lawrence Livermore 
would only apply if it were a licensed facility of ours. In Lawrence Livermore, maybe a DOE All right, facility. Well, one of your I facilities. Don't, but whatever the facility I, is, if it's one of our licensees. One of your licensees uh, uh, applies, so the, 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 the question is how do they dispose of, 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 of different levels of waste, right? Assuming no, have, the question, no, the question is the residual in the ground, uh, the residual at the site or on the walls of the building. So this not only goes to landfills, it goes to, as you said, whether the, the threshold at which the, the government can walk away from these sites. That's right. Mr. Sinar made it very clear to us that we have sites out there that we've walked away from that he considers contaminated and that we should go back and check them and make sure they meet current restrictions. And we have walked away from those and in some cases uh, based on uh, what I don't think is a, is a consistent criteria. We have uh, documents from the staff and we've decided we hire a contractor to go survey it, but, but we really have not done a very good job of saying, yeah, that's clean enough and it's no longer a regulated facility. Well, would it, uh, see, it, would, it, would, it, would, it would be my impression then that that would, that, uh, 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 would raise the specter then of, of the EPA's concern uh, raise the likelihood that, that it, it's conceivable that this policy becomes more entangled in, in, uh, in the clean water uh, than was suggested in, the, in even the EPA's testimony and their criticism. Well, for because we you're not talking about, uh, you know, uh, we raised this issue with respect to licensing of new uh, solid waste sites, uh, obviously the technology and the engineering is dramatically different than it was from sites 25 and 30 years ago. Uh, but this also goes to the question of site engineering and what have you on, uh, on uh, uh, contaminated sites that, that you're, you're attempt to clean up. So the numbers become fairly important at that point. Uh, certainly the numbers are important. Right. Mr. Clark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Carr, I'd like to ask you uh, to clarify the situation in regard to EPA. Uh, one of our earlier, uh, some of our earlier testimony pointed out the protection of drinking water, the NRC policy would allow some people to be exposed to up to 10 millirem per year from an exempted practice. EPA's drinking water standards limits exposure <coughs> to no more than 4 millirem per year. In the last analysis, does the Commission accept EPA standards? Uh, EPA's drinking water standards we certainly accept, yes, sir. But uh, before we would grant somebody an exemption, we would ensure that that exemption didn't tend to bring any of EPA's drinking water standards up to the four millirem per year uh, criteria. So when we, before we grant an exemption, we're going to look at all the possible pathways that that exemption might get into drinking water. And it's up to us to protect the, to comply with EPA standards. And so we have the responsibility to ensure that any exemption we might grant or a combination of exemptions we would, might grant don't contaminate somebody's water supply. And it would comply with EPA standards? Uh, we're required to comply with EPA standards, right. yes, sir. And then, then I, and, and since we had the testimony from the different uh, state officials, uh, it's clear that, that uh, the nuke that the NRC would regulate BRC waste for uh, uh, in, in the state low-level waste deposits. Well, uh, we haven't made a. Are you asking about the state compatibility question? Yeah, they, they were. They talked about preemption, and, and yeah. I, I just yeah. Well, we haven't made a decision on preemption. Uh, the decision on preemption will be made on each individual ruling we make. That's the way we do preemption. Uh, each rule that we put out, we have to make a decision on preemption on whether it becomes a matter of state compatibility or not. And we have four levels of compatibility. Some require strict compatibility and then the fourth level probably just says you've got to have something that addresses this. And so each time we make an exemption, we will have to decide whether that particular exemption should be or should not be a matter of compatibility for a state. Some would be, if it's a serious public health and safety problem, we would probably require it to be compatible. But each of those decisions are going to be made on the exemptions that are requested. So it's not a... I mean, I understand their question and I understand their problem, but we can't, ad we can't address that compatibility issue until we get a an exemption request in front of us. Yes, I yield. 
I might, uh, it, it appears in my mind to be inconsistent, but maybe you can explain it, Mr. Carr, and that is on the bottom of 13, you say the NRC regulations exempting BRC waste will not affect the authority of the state or local agencies to regulate BRC waste for purposes other than radiation protection. Other than radiation, stand yes, sir. As I say, if it's a matter of public health and safety from a radiation standpoint, uh, then we might make it a, a, a matter of compatibility, the highest level of matter of compatibility, where we think the public health and safety might be affected if they didn't comply. Yeah. And we've got numerous cases of where the state's what about compatibility where standards, I mean, the some what about where it's incompatible, where they want to comply, and you want to, and, and that's inconsistent with the, well, with the exemption? Well, I don't know that there will be one of those. No, it sounds like to me that will be them all. Well, I mean, if you listen to the three gentlemen that were here from Pennsylvania, Illinois, and Maine, it sounds to me like what they're going to tell you is they don't think any of this is compatible. Now what do you do? Well. But I mean, I was here once before on, on, on radiation sites before where the commissioner sat here and said, any state that doesn't want nuclear waste, we abide by that. And then I was here when we overrode that decision in the state of Nevada. So it's not a question of, of, uh, of the compatibility you're talking about. It's where the state decides they want to set a standard for radiation protection that, that, that is tougher than what you think the exemption requires, and they say, not in our state. Isn't that inconsistent with what you're just suggesting here about preemption? No. Where I you don't. walk away from that exemption at that point, the state I has a veto? I don't think so. And all the, suit, the lawsuits they talk about the NRC bringing, we wouldn't normally bring a lawsuit. The lawsuit would be brought by the person who wanted to take advantage of our exemption policy. Okay, fine. And the state wasn't compatible. So, so the applicant brings a lawsuit, and they say, we think the NRC allows us policy allows us, excuse me, Mr. Clark, for using your time, but allows us the disposal oh, on the exemption in the state, and the state attorney general says the hell it does. We specifically prohibit that. We have a tougher standard. And that's when the courts would decide. And that's when, so there is, in fact, preemption envisioned here. Not necessarily, because I don't know what way stream you're talking about. Well, did you listen to the three people who were here before? I, certainly, I heard them, but we're all You think they have a policy that's compatible with what you want to do here? Uh, I don't know yet because we don't have an application yeah. from anybody. Okay. I, I just uh, been they down have this a, road before. I watched it all before. Well, you notice they have a B. Yes. They have a B. They have a BRC policy. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania has passed legislation and the governor has signed it. Uh, with totally inconsistent with your own policy. I don't know what will result, but Pennsylvania has clearly made a decision. What will happen? I don't know, but well, nothing will happen if nobody applies for an exemption. Well, yeah, but, uh, excuse me, you, you're here, very, you know, we're here about whether or not we should let this policy go, f go, this particular findings with respect to policy go forward or not. But you're, but and you're, you're saying, don't worry because nothing's going to happen unless somebody makes an application. But, you're but at some point down the road when the application's made and you're defending your policy, you're defending the numbers and your standards, and the state's attorney from, from Pennsylvania is saying our law 107 is inconsistent, you're going to argue preemption. No, sir. You, uh, the policy is not focused. You're focused today. Everybody's been focused on waste in a local landfill. That's not the purpose of this policy. The purpose of this policy... Well, what about when, forget land skills. When you want to walk away from one of your contaminated sites of one of your licensees and you say, well, under our exemption, it's clean. That's right. It's a no threat to public health and safety as far as the, as far as the federal government is concerned. That's a clean site. And the state, the state at a, that point is where? You can build a playground on it. You can do yeah. whatever you want. Uh -huh. Right. <laughs> I can see the governor's uh, cutting that ribbon. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I just don't, you look at it, if you, you uh, uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I think, you know, you, the commission has decided that preemption is the way to carry it. Don't mislead no. us about whether or not preemption is a reality and integral to this policy or not. If it is, say so. We well, can make the determinations. Well, I don't believe it is, but I'll yield to any of my other Well, then why don't we take it out of the policy? Uh, uh, it's not in the policy. Okay. okay. Excuse me, Mr. Clark. All right. That really
covers my questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> well, one of my bad habits, among others. Uh, we have a vote, but Mr. Uh, Mr. Hosmar. Well, what happens, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, if a Excuse me. What happens if someone does apply in Pennsylvania? Obviously, as you indicated, and you're correct, unless someone well, applies. Well, I think federal law says that the federal, uh, that the government has preemption on public health and safety from nuclear radiation matters. Uh, but that's for the courts to decide with. They've been <coughs> into the courts on this issue a few what, times. What is your view as chairman of the commission? If it came to a public health and safety problem, I think it would be federal, uh, the federal courts would decide that we were, the, by words, the law, we were the ones responsible for the protection of the public health and safety. But I'll yield to the general counsel. He yielded to you. Don't look at me. Uh, uh, would you like to swear the general counsel before he makes his comment? Well, I, I, yes. I, You solemnly swear the, uh, or affirm that the testimony you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. As I stated to the other members of the commission, and I don't know if this applies to you, Mr. Counsel, that uh, in order to inform them of their rights as a witness before the committee, the limitations and authority of the, of the committee and the rules of the House of Representatives Committee are, were on the, are on the table in front of you. I do not know if they have been previously provided to you. You can state whether. I'm ready to proceed, Mr. Chairman. Okay. And also that you are advised of your right to counsel, counsel. Yes, sir. Uh, <laughs> and you do not desire to have counsel. No, sir. Thank you. My understanding of the pending uh, question uh, is that uh, I was asked to uh, comment uh, on the uh, general discussion about whether or not there would be federal preemption in the radiological uh, health and safety area for the three types of materials that uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has been given the authority by the Congress to uh, regulate. And the answer to that question is not uh, dependent upon the BRC statement. As I understand it, the answer to that question was given by the Congress when they amended the Atomic Energy Act in 1959 to make it uh, clear that with regard to radiological public health and safety matters involving these materials, at least in the commercial area, that the uh, NRC did have the, uh, the authority to make final uh, decisions. The, uh, the courts uh, have so held, Mr. Chairman, in connection with, as I'm sure you know, the California moratorium uh, legislation. And there have been uh, more recent uh, reaffirmance as by the, uh, the, the courts uh, of that uh, decision. However, it should be uh, emphasized that everything else other than uh, radiological health and uh, safety uh, is, is somebody else's uh, uh, business and not uh, this commission's. So when it comes to radiological health and safety, the federal government would have the power of preemption. Is that what you're saying? Have the power of what? Preemption. I'm saying that uh, the, the Congress has uh, given this uh, commission that authority and the courts have so Well, in Pennsylvania, I'm not a lawyer, but in Pennsylvania, we've passed a law and the governor signed a law which says no low-level radioactive waste will be disposed of in any municipal landfill in Pennsylvania. And all low-level radioactive waste, regardless of its degree of radioactivity, and all low-level waste will be disposed of at a licensed, permitted disposal facility only. Is that inconsistent with the NRC policy which we're talking about today? It's not a question of being inconsistent with NRC policy uh, in uh, my judgment. It is a question, a question like this, or whether the, uh, the statute, the state statute, is inconsistent uh, with federal uh, law. I am not able uh, to make uh, preemption uh, judgments uh, in the uh, abstract. I have not. Uh, Reached well, any, this uh, is not ab <coughs> abstract. I've read you a statute which has been adopted by the legislature of my state and signed by the governor of the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. And I'm asking you if you all would be able to bury this stuff in a landfill anyway. In I'm not able to make uh, question, uh, to give uh, answers about preemption questions unless the issues are specifically joined. Yes. Well, let, me, let me ask you if, you, if, if I might, uh, we're running out of time, we're going to have a series of votes, and I don't 
want to impose on you to hold you over until those votes are done. But let me just ask you, if I might, I, inter I understand your answer to be that, in fact, this policy, when and if formalized all the way down to the end where an exemption would be granted, this policy would carry with it the authority that Congress has given uh, uh, the NRC through the Atomic Energy Act, the power of preemption. Now, whether that would be used, challenged, or sued upon, that is cons that, that this policy would carry with it that, that power or authority. Yes. Because we have previously granted to the Commission that, 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 that authority. That's uh, consistent with what I was uh, saying. How that uh, authority should be exercised is a different issue. Is a different issue. No, I understand that. But, but that authority exists whether it's BRC. I understand that. I understand that. But the issue, the issue has been raised, I believe, by Senator Mitchell and others, whether or not, if we are going to deal this, whether we need specific legislation to to, re to remove preemption from this uh, 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 from this policy. You want to come back? Okay, I'm going to ask you. Wait, we're going to we're going to go vote, and we will we will in fact return. Apparently, there will be time before the uh, next vote. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the uh, subcommittee will come to order, please. Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd like to correct the record. Chairman Carr, uh, we do have. I, I'm told we do have two positions in-house that will be coming under this policy. Both are from universities, one from Rockefeller University and one from the University of Utah, and they're both for waste from medical research purposes. Thank you. Ms. Cosmar. Now, just to uh, settle this, uh, Mr. Chairman, Chairman Carr, it's my understanding then that in your view, uh, if Pennsylvania, as it apparently does, objects to the location of this material within its borders on uh, the grounds of health that uh, they could be overruled by the federal government? Well, I, based on the confusion of this, let me try to walk you through what we think will happen. If somebody applies for a, an exemption request and we grant the exemption, uh, then uh, they uh, try to put it, we'll say, uh, do whatever they want to with it in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania says you can't do that. Which Pennsylvania has said. Uh, and they take Pennsylvania to court on a health and safety standpoint, uh, then they're taking our, our uh, exemption versus the Pennsylvania law, and the federal courts will decide that. That's and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's view on this is oh. uh, you would be siding with the... I'm not sure we have to take a side. Well, do you have a position? Uh, it depends on whether or not we've made it a matter of compatibility on the individual exemption. If we made it a, a matter of compatibility, then I guess we'd take a side that, yes, that it should, uh, they should apply by our standards. But as I say, there are four degrees of compatibility. Well, I understand. But yeah. to put it simply, you believe then that despite the law passed in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania that the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's position on this should prevail, and that in spite of state law... Certainly it should prevail if it's a matter of public health and safety, yes, sir. Well, it certainly is a matter of public health and safety to Pennsylvania. That's the reason for the law, in their view. Well, uh, it, it appears to me that these laws that were passed were, in effect, freezing the exemption policy that we already have been using. Uh, we can't exempt anything under Pennsylvania's law as of today, uh, because they froze it as of 1 January. Well, uh, me, that seems strange to me, uh, let me because ask, we've been doing it for 30 years. Let, let me ask Commissioner Curtis uh, how he feels about preemption. This is, a, this is the issue on which I, uh, among others, expressed additional views in my uh, statement. Let me... Disagreeing views? Well, disagreeing in part and agreeing in part, and it's a complicated issue. It does depend upon the facts of a given case, so I want to walk through the four or five points that I think are important. Uh, first of all, as the chairman indicates, this policy statement itself is not legally binding. That is to say, we wouldn't expect to have a preemption or a compatibility uh, legal uh, disagreement at this point because the policy hasn't been implemented in the specific rulemakings or the licensing actions that will actually have the legal effect of implementing this policy. And I do agree with the, the chairman and the majority that at this point we do not have a 
preemption question or a compatibility question before us in terms of the legal posture of the case. Secondly, in my view, uh, for the reasons that I set forth in my additional views, this is an important issue, uh, particularly in the area of low-level waste. Uh, there are three or four categories of activities that are covered by this policy statement. Low-level waste is one. The recycle of material is a second. The decommissioning sites the chairman has referred to as a third, and consumer products is a fourth. I agree with the majority position on three of those four. The one area where I disagree is in the area of low-level waste disposal. Uh, in my view, it's a close legal question. You've heard the views of the general counsel here. I place uh, greater emphasis, perhaps, than others do on the Low-Level Waste Act of 1985, which turned over that responsibility for developing the sites to the states. Uh, and I look at that statute and have reached a different conclusion. But I want to emphasize that I think it's a question on which reasonable people can differ. There is, in fact, a provision in the low-level waste statute. And the essential difference between your position, Commissioner? My position is that I would not treat these determinations in the low-level waste arena as a matter of compatibility, regardless of whether the purpose of the state legislation was radiation safety related or not. And that's the difference between the majority and me. Let me emphasize two other points. First of all, I think we're a long ways off from making that determination at this point. Uh, the policy statement at this point is not legally binding. If we issue a regulation that typically takes two years within the agency, an agreement state then has an additional three years to come in compl into compliance if it is a matter of compatibility, and that depends upon what the Commission does in the specific case. It would be my view that at that time I'd make an effort to convince the Commission that the matter ought to be considered something other than a matter of compatibility consistent with but, the views uh, that I've expressed. I'm sorry. To but it's five years off before we reach that determination. But it is your view that uh, low-level waste should be deregulated? It's my view that low-level radioactive waste that is granted an exemption under this policy that uh, at least today is the responsibility of the states under the 85 statute should not be declared a matter of compatibility. Uh, let me ask you, uh, Chairman Carr, if I could, just a question about the uh, relevance or the importance of the background exposure which most of us get in our normal daily lives. Uh, is that a factor here in uh, your decision? It's a factor in, our, in, in the number we chose because we think we chose a number that certainly within the variations in normal background and therefore we think that the number is satisfactory. But I want to emphasize to you that the numbers we're using are encompassed within the range of scientific opinion. We're not outside those scientists. Uh, we're somewhere in that range. They talk numbers 1 to 10. Well, what uh, do you think the danger is of the average exposure? From, from our BRC policy? You no, know, from background material. Do well, 500,000 people a year die of cancer in this country. Yeah. And you heard EPA say if we put our policy into effect, there may be another death every two years. Uh, to add to that 500,000. So uh, that from says... From policy or from a practice? Well, EPA from said. a practice. Excuse me. Yeah, this. <laughs> You're right. And how many practices can there be? I don't know. Well, EPA does not consider the comparison of the risk, risks posed by man-made sources to the risk from background sources relevant. Uh, they don't make this comparison, I gather, you, you do. Well, that's how we came up with a number. That's how I came up with the numbers that I thought we should support was uh, if, if I fly from, to California and back twice a year, I'm in that BRC range, and I may exceed it if I fly one more time, and that doesn't, uh, it doesn't impact my decision on whether to go or not. But is it right uh, that you are less concerned with the amount of background exposure that all of us get uh, in our daily lives? You think it's somewhat less serious uh, than the EPA does, and therefore you're less concerned about adding to it than, than they are. Uh. I don't, I don't think they comment, and I'm not sure I, I know what you're asking me. Well, I'm asking you uh, how important and, or how dangerous, really, the, the uh, levels of exposure are uh, that all of us are subjected to in our daily lives, whether you consider them not particularly dangerous, very dangerous, or somewhere in between. Well, I'd like to not see 500,000 people a year die of cancer. I don't know whether that's from background or what it's Well, from. that's what I'm asking you. I'm asking you whether it is in part from background and what the role of background exposure is in those deaths and how oh, important it is. Well, I think it is important. 
uh, as important as your, EPA? You'll see radon. Uh, we are all under the radon exposure now, which is probably the highest exposure any of us get. And if we, you know, if, if you live in a brick house, you're exceeding our BRC level, you could move to a wooden house and save that 10 MR. Well, EPA says that many risks associated with natural background radiation are in fact relatively high and thus are not appropriate as a benchmark for evaluating the need for regulation. But that's an opinion. Yes. And, and we have an opinion. As I say, this, this whole issue is so all I'm mostly asking, opinion asking, and I'm not... I'm asking you whether you disagree with their opinion. Uh, I don't guess I disagree with their opinion, but my opinion is when, I, when we pick the numbers, we picked it because of its insignificance relative to background radiation that we all endure every day. Right. So you think background uh, exposure is not as important as EPA thinks it is. EPA, just many risks associated with natural background radiation are relatively high and thus are not appropriate as a benchmark for evaluating the need for regulation. They don't think that you should be using background exposure to determine whether or not additional exposure from man-made sources is dangerous or not. Well, I don't have any other thing to use because there is no science. Fine. You're entitled to your opinion. I'm just asking yeah. you, you disagree. All they right. have their opinion, you have yours. You disagree with EPA on this issue. They attach more importance to the danger levels of background exposure than you do. You may be right. I don't know. No, I don't think, I don't think you characterized it, right? All right. Well, I just read their statement. I, I didn't make it up. No, no, you just said that I disagree with well, EPA. Well, I asked you. You won't tell me. Yeah, I think the background radiation is dangerous. As dangerous as EPA does. They feel oh, it is this dangerous. They feel it is this dangerous, that it's dangerous enough that it should not be used as a benchmark. Let me quote you what the Beer 5 Committee said. Oh, please don't do that. Well, studies of populations chronically exposed to low-level radiation, such as those residing in regions of elevated natural background radiation, have not shown consistent or conclusive evidence of an associated increase in the risk of cancer. Right. I agree with that statement. Which if is EPA disagrees with it, then I disagree I with EPA. That's all I asked. So the Nuclear Regulatory Commission and the agency charged uh, with uh, protecting the American people against the hazards of environmental radiation disagree on this subject. No, we agree with the Beer 5 Committee on this subject, and I don't know where EPA stands. What is the Beer? I don't know what I that is. I just read. You want me to read it again? No, no. Just tell me what it is. Is it part of your outfit or part of theirs? Or? No, no. That, that's part of the National Academy of Sciences Study Committee on the biological effects of ionizing radiation. There are now up to five studies. Uh, we can send you that report, sir. Well, I'll, I'll conclude, but I, I gather that uh, there is a fundamental disagreement between EPA and, and you. I'm not I don't think that's right. Mr. Curtis, do you want to add to no, that? I, I, the, uh, there really were two considerations that went in. The, the background radiation, it seems to me, in my view, puts this question in context and I think perhaps uh, is as useful to explain it to the American public in terms of the relative risks that are out there today in the radiation area. I don't think we intend to diminish uh, uh, whatever risk is posed by background radiation. I think the Beer 5 report accurately characterizes but Mr. that. If I'm correct, and maybe I'm not, not, Mr. Carr keeps saying we get so much every day anyway, this only adds so much to it. Let me, let me put Isn't it, that right? Let me put it differently in terms of what I thought was important and where I think we and EPA share a common ground. The individual dose criteria of one for widespread practices and ten for the ones that affect limited populations reflect the range of risk that the International Atomic Energy Agency has deemed to be acceptable. Now, I don't take it there's any dispute on one millirem. I didn't understand EPA's comments today to say that they disagreed with 10 millirem as a single dose. Their concern, as I understand it, is with the potential for getting multiple practices and multiple exposures that may come close to the 100 millirem population limit that we have established. And it seems to me the way to focus on that question, the IAEA did it one way. They reduced the uh, 10 millirem by an order of magnitude to one. Having found that anything within the 1 to 10 range was acceptable from the standpoint of risk, there's another way to do that, and it's the way that's laid out in the policy statement for focusing on the question of how you limit multiple practices. But I don't interpret the IEA, nor do I interpret EPA, nor do I interpret the policy statement as saying that anything within the range of 1 to 10 is unacceptable from a risk standpoint. In fact, quite the opposite. 
What is your own view about the maximum dose rate? Uh, what What do you think it uh, What do you think is a safe level? Well, for purposes of this policy statement, the IEA has taken a look at that issue. Chairman Carr has quoted you what Bear 5 indicated, and the IEA, which has been very influential in my thinking on this, indicated that exposures between 1 and 10 could be deemed negligible. Would be? Negligible. And uh, from a risk standpoint. Chairman Carr, you share that? Yes, sir. And the collective dose, uh, Commissioner Curtis, how about the collective dose? What is your view on that? I have uh, I have a different view on the collective dose. A different uh, view from from the from the majority, and again, uh, it's in part driven by what the IEA has said. But let me let me say that the collective dose question was one that was debated within the commission, with a question as to whether we ought to have a collective dose at all in this policy statement. I'm pleased to see that we've got a collective dose because that's something that. But you think it's too low? I think, or? I think the number that we've selected, uh, in my view, uh, is higher than I'd like to see. I suggested an order of by magnitude. By a factor of? By an order of magnitude. 100 versus 1,000. So by a factor of 10? Yes, sir. So the exposure levels to which the Nuclear Regulatory Commission would expose people is 10 times higher than you would expose people? Uh, I, as I say, the collective dose. Is that right or is that wrong? The collective dose decision that was made in this policy statement is an order of magnitude higher so than what I, I would have correct preferred. In layman's it, terms, is that correct? Then? Repeat what you said. You uh, feel, uh, they feel that uh, the exposure levels can be 10 times higher than you do. Well, I th they've indicated that the collective dose, in their judgment, can be an order of magnitude higher, yes. So I'm correct? Yes. Uh, well, so why are you shaking your head, Mr. Rogers? Because I don't, I don't agree with that uh, interpretation. <clears throat> you don't, well, I know you don't agree with the determinant. The, well, uh, I, don't, I don't think that properly characterizes the issue. But are you saying that you don't agree with the... With your the, statement. And I don't think uh, when it's unclear to me as to what Curtis. you are saying when you say levels of exposure. We're all talking about the 1 and 10 numbers as individual exposures. You're talking about collective exposures. You're talking about an individual exposure multiplied by a population. And if you take a larger individual exposure and a smaller population, you'll get the same thing. <clears throat> and what we're, what we're arguing about there, excuse me, I've got a little bit of bronchitis, but what we're arguing about here is how you treat the multiplicity of people that might conceivably be exposed to something. Well, uh, uh, and how broadly do you cast that net? Well, I think what I was asking Commissioner Curtis uh, is whether or not, in his view, the, the exposure, I'm trying to put this as clearly as I can, the exposure to the population as a whole is, under the NRC's uh, view, in the NRC's view, 10 times higher than you'd like to see it. That, that is my question. If you would answer it yes or no. Yeah, I think that's a fair general description of where and we And you stand. disagree with that, Commissioner Rogers? I, yes, I do, in a sense. I think it's unclear. I think that uh, we're not, uh, what we're, we have to focus on exposures to individuals. When you're talking about a collective exposure. Well, I, I we agree, and there is an exposure level to individuals, but we're discussing exposure <coughs> levels to whole populations. But the exposure by a particular source does not go to the entire population in general. In general, there's nothing that we are concerned with that it influences every single individual in this country. Well, you'll have you to take, take that up with Mr. Curtis. Uh, yeah, let me you take, here. take a certain risk level that's your, and multiply your disagreement, by I guess, is with Commissioner a population Curtis. number, then you'll get a number. Well, what does that number mean? Yeah, it doesn't did. necessarily mean Well, let me ask Mr. Curtis if you disagree with you that. agree with Commissioner Rogers? No, no let me jump in. Well, just no, 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 I want to ask Mr. Curtis. We disagreed he, with him uh, three to uh, one. I want to, I want to ask for an explanation from Mr. Curtis, Mr. Carr, if you don't mind. Let me see if I can clear it up. The policy statement sets a color. I want to know whether you agree with Commissioner Rogers I, or not. If I can answer the question. Thank you. Uh, I'll proceed to do that. The policy statement sets a collective dose of a thousand person rim. In my additional views, which have been provided to the subcommittee, I supported a collective dose of a hundred person rim. In reaching that determination, the IAEA views were influential in my mind. But I want to emphasize two additional points. Number one, there was a debate and continues to be a debate in the radiation community about whether a collective dose is appropriate to have at all. Do you think it is? I think it is, and I'm pleased to see and that this Mr. Rogers disagrees. Can That's I, simple. No, can, no, I, I think can I finish? A collective dose is an appropriate yes. additional measure. Oh, you do? But yes. It's an additional measure. You don't think it means anything, though? Or, or? No, I didn't say that at all, sir. Oh, do, do you think it means something? 
I think it has some significance, yes. Very much. I think one has to be careful about what is significance But you obviously with. think it's less significant than Commissioner Curtis does. Is that no, fair? No, I think that the number that uh, I don't, not necessarily at all, it's a question of what's a reasonable number for that collective dose. Well. Not whether it's significant to have a collective dose or not. And the, and the reason is that when you're talking about a collective dose, you're talking about this within the context of the individual dose limits that we've set. We think that it's very important that you track the individual dose limits. This is the one or 10 milligram. The question then is, well, what are you willing to conceive of with respect to a very large population that might be exposed to no more than that? And what that num what, how big that population might be? Because then that would give you the collective dose, the maximum collective dose. And so, in a sense, you don't have a very good control on that, but it does give you some measure of the extent to which uh, one would consider the pervasiveness of any particular practice. And uh, the, the key thing, in my view, is the individual dose limit. I, I don't want to pursue it. I've taken enough time. I gather Mr. Curtis thinks that it's 10 times too high, and you don't. You disagree with Mr. Curtis. That's Can I? Oh, we disagree yeah, of course, on, Mr. No, Chair I Chairman Carr. Can I, I'd like to make one point that yes, sir. The, the thousand number is ten times lower than the UN committee says uh, can be used for any meaningful discussion on, on uh, this dose limit for a population. They say if you're looking at anything in a cumulative dose of, of less than 10,000 man rem, then you're liable to be making conclusions that you can't substantiate. So we're a factor of 10 below that. Commissioner Curtis would like to go a factor of 10 down, and he was not persuasive to the other members. Well, that, that's true, but I, I, I gather I'm correct in saying that 1,000 is still 10 times higher than the original staff recommendation. And 10 times lower than the UN recommendation. Three times pi r squared, but where the hell are we? We're in a numbers game where um, the numbers are really so low as to be uh, tough to depend given, on. Given what you've just said, if I might, Mr. Kusmar, yes, and Mr. Rogers, what, what, what you have just said, if, I, if I've listened and understand it correctly, and then I reread the EPA objections, even if you're correct, the EPA suggests that this policy is flawed on its face for the moment, and you may change this by regulation, but for the moment, in their view, this policy is flawed because they still don't believe that it has the ability to protect people from the multiple exposures by the definitions of practice and the notion of truncation that, that, that uh, uh, Mr. Guilfoyle was, was, was talking to us about earlier, that you have made some decisions about levels that increase risk or, or, or uh, 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 without any effect, they would make those differently. The questions of how widely uh, defined practices will or will not be goes to the question of whether 10 becomes important in terms of 100 or 1,000. And so even if, they, if, if, we, if we leave Mr. Curtis's uh, notion aside for a second, they're suggesting that, w that within the policy, they don't like, for the moment, the safeguards that they see even accepting these numbers. I think, uh, I think uh, EPA's points were well taken. That we, uh, how you implement the policy is going to be very important. And uh, I think also the broad definition of a practice is important. And we plan to take that into consideration. We have, we have taken a lot of EPA's comments into consideration. The idea that we and EPA are in, in disagreement uh, we're only in a small disagreement, and we're coming closer together. Well, these are small numbers. Well, Politically, could, they're very if large. I could just say, because I got myself into this thing, uh, and, uh, and that is that I think the question <coughs> of the definition of a policy, a uh, practice, excuse me, a definition of what constitutes a practice, and the difference between the 100 or the 1,000 number that Commissioner Curtis and I uh, differ a little bit on, I think that those, those two have to be taken together. And I think that when they are, there will be no disagreement. Well, what, what, what concerns me is, is, you, is you head down that road, and I think what has concerned others, obviously, in, in, including, including the EPA, that uh, you know, you, the, 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 
original staff memo on this where, where uh, 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 your Office of Nuclear Materials and Safety Safeguards did not concur in, 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 the, in, the, in the 10 uh, uh, millirems and uh, EPA has not uh, concurred in that. Uh, apparently, the uh, International Atomic uh, Energy Agency has not uh, does not concur in that. Uh, now we, we've 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 got so people. Wrong. How so? That's uh, wrong. That's wrong. Where, okay. I, I, how, where do they not concur in it? In what what in what documentation is that? No, well, in yeah. terms of, of the safety series eighty nine of the IAEA does agree does one to ten. So that's. But. Uh, you say that makes the case for you what you've done. Well, in the range of one to ten, me, so that's right. But, okay. but what we're, uh, you know, the idea that there is disagreement uh, in these numbers exists. There, I don't argue that, uh, and we have we have said to all and any, and we still wait to be convinced. If they'll bring forth some kind of evidence that our numbers are wrong, we'll be happy to change them. But as of today, that doesn't that doesn't exist. But and in fact, you're working to try to raise the numbers, aren't you? No, we're trying to set a number. You're not trying to change the, you're not trying the, to change the water standards, the drinking water standards? You don't no, want no. those raised? No. We're, we're not changing the drinking water standard. We'll comply with that. No, I know you complied with it. Are you asking that it be raised from no. 4 to 25? No. You're not? No. We may think it's too low, but we'll comply with it as long as it's there. <laughs> but we, we make public comments just like they make them to us. So, so you've, object, you've objected to that standard? Well, I don't know what, yeah, I'm not sure what we've objected to at the staff level, uh, or, but, uh, yeah, we feel free to express our opinions. Well, I mean, this, you know, this is the, this is the matrix in which this, this committee and members of Congress and the public have got to look at this. I mean, well, you've been very clever this morning to suggest that there really isn't preemption, and yet when we find out when it comes down to health and safety, you've told Congressman Costamire that there is, in fact, preemption. Push you, comes to shove. What you have given us. You've suggested that, that, that there's a body of evidence that, 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 that agrees with you. We've suggested that there's a body of evidence that doesn't agree with you. And we agree with that. Okay. You've, all, you've, also, you've also suggested that, uh, uh, that, that the issue that, that, that this is sort of speculative in nature, if you, if you will. You there, know, that, that some applicant is going to appear out of somewhere. We now learn that there are two applicants. There, well, let they were in you, before let me the ask you what happens when oh. the applicant is the federal government, when it's the Department of Energy. It's not some jewelry maker. Well, they were, they're not a licensee, but th these, these applications were in before the policy statement was issued. They were held. So it's not, it's not speculative. In fact, people would, would like to take advantage of this, of this policy. But we had... I understand. No. I understand. No, we're you talking don't. I'm not sure you understood what I was going to say. We've had applications and we've granted exemptions for 30 years. I understand what that. What we're you trying to do is to bring some statement. kind of order in this, and there are no standards out there. EPA, if they will issue a standard, will comply with it. You heard him say it wasn't high on his level but of, of things to get done because it was not a high threat to public health and safety, low levels of radiation. Uh, we're trying to get we're trying to get something done because we have a job to do. We have to be able to do our work in cleaning up contaminated sites. Uh, the, the waste issue of this has diverted the whole thing, in my opinion. Uh, I think it may have, too, because I think the states would be more interested in what, is, more interested maybe in what is the threshold on which you decide to walk away from one of these sites. I would think so, too. But we're in the level that is just measured. We're at the level of being able to barely measure this. You know, 10 MR a year is micro rim. You have to have a, almost a laboratory instrument to measure it. I understand. And so when we get out there to walk away from one of these sites and say that's clean, uh, we're at the bottom. And then a lot of that will depend upon whether or not you're successful in your objections to, 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 the, to the levels within, within water, within the EPA clean water stands. And if those can be raised. Well, those sites. Site wait a minute, wait a minute. Then, then the threshold for you to cross to walk away from a site will be somewhat easier. So, you know, this isn't an isolated policy because there's a series of other decisions that are going to be made down the road. Well, uh, uh -huh. I agree that uh, radiation is worldwide, if that's your point, because it is. Uh, no, that's not my point. Well, your point was that if 
that any decision we make on this could affect water, and I agree with that. What we what we have to do is to make sure that the decisions we make don't affect the water in the law in the area where we're making We are in the decisions. situation now that the standard that you have picked is it would be a contam would, would contaminate water under the Clean Water Act under the no. EPA standards. It no, it's a, it's a responsibility of ours to see that it doesn't do no, that. No, I understand that. You know, we're cleaning up AFTI after 25 years of your responsibility. We're trying to clean up for yeah, I understand. 30 years after. Yeah, and all the assurances that but, were made prior those, to those actions, other congressmen went, uh-huh, uh-huh, sounds good to me. No. But those sites... Now we have a national embarrassment and, and, and a budget problem that we can't even come to grips with. But those sites exist today. They're out there. I understand that. I can't move them. They're, if they're near a water site, they're near a water site. <laughs> exactly my point. We've got to clean them exactly up. Exactly my point. And we've got to make the decision of how clean is clean enough. And so... And, and what you know, do you you're want... You're making, the, you're making the case, Commissioner. You're making the case. You know, you, you can I'm clean here to it try up to make with, the case. You can clean it up with technology, and you can clean it up with engineering, and you can clean it up with, with money. Or you can clean it up by changing the definitions. And I don't think that that's going to be acceptable to the American public. Okay? Because you're right. This is a struggle about what is clean no. is clean. You're what is safe is safe. And you have one view, and the state of Pennsylvania has another, and the state of Maine has another. And I suspect when you petition or whatever the process is by which you want to declare Rocky Mountain Flats or somebody else or whatever these, whatever these sites are that you want to leave, you will have one definition, and the people that have to live there and the governor of the state and the mayor of the city, they will have another. And so you're right. We're down to the fundamentals. And we're not about, you know, simply to meet our obligation by changing definitions. We do that in Graham Rudman. We take things on and off budget. But in this case, you're playing with our environment, you're playing with toxics, you're playing with people's health and safety. We're not the gentleman behind you apparently doesn't like that characterization, we're not playing but with what toxics. we're arguing over here is health and safety standards. But we're not playing with toxics and we're not changing You're definitions. Not. We're trying to set a standard in the absence of a standard. No, there isn't. There is a standard. No, there isn't. You know? That's what concerns you. No, there this are no be, standards. This, this can all be, this can be, uh, with respect. Where is a standard? This is a list uh, which I've been given, which is an NRC document, which lists various countries and the gentleman yield, various countries and various organizations whose standards are very different from yours. Uh, IAEA 100, ICRP 100, uh, but there's UK 100, Canada it just says small, Sweden says small, uh, Italy 100, and you're 1,000. Yeah, there's a column in there that it shows some differences in what they're looking at in those countries versus what we're looking at. Well, that's the column that says scope, and it says general waste, and right down for everyone it says general waste. Well, some of them don't. No, they all do. This is your document. They're virtually all. There are virtually about 15 all. of them, I think. 12 of them say the same thing. Why do you disagree with everybody else, including a member of your own commission, the EPA, and these other organizations and countries? I That's all we're concerned about. Just yep. gives us some reason to be concerned. Why, are you, why, are, why is your standard so much different from everyone else's consistently? That's all, including Mr. Curtis's. That's, the, that's what concerns us. Well, let me just say, if I, if I might, obviously uh, this isn't the end of this process, but uh, 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 you know, this notion of, of below regulatory concern, I think you ought to crank into this, the notion of below public concern, too. Because uh, I think the reaction that we have, we have already seen, whether you're going to leave a, a, a contaminated site or whether you're going to allow this to be put into landfills, uh, the public uh, has a great deal of concern over this policy. Uh, while you've been debating this policy, similar uh, or the same questions have been debated within, within various state legislatures, and they've made their findings known. And one of the ways we get into a great deal of trouble in this city is when we decide we know better than everybody else. We usually get singed. And I can appreciate and the, the, the issues that, that, that this commission struggles with are complicated, they're troublesome, they're a pain in the rear in many instances. Uh, but that impatience you know, cannot drive us to create a public policy that simply has no acceptance. That may make you right. That may then make my job tougher in terms of, of allocating resources for the cleanup of those sites. 
We don't, we don't, we, we can't escape that. But that in of itself cannot drive us uh, to, to, to create a policy that, 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 that the public won't, the public won't accept. And, and I appreciate that, that, uh, that there are differences of opinion between, uh, within this commission, between you and EPA, between you and some of your staff, uh, people between you and some of the uh, some of the states and in, and various international scientific bodies, I don't seek to make light of that, because I think it, it raises serious policy concerns. You have now made a determination, and that policy is going to have to going to have to withstand public scrutiny. And if it doesn't, and, and it is changed or it, 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 it's 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 repealed or or what have you, uh, uh, that will certainly be a disappointment for this for this commission. Uh, but that's not necessarily a failure. It may just show how it, even more complex uh, these problems have become and how much more expensive they have become uh, over the last decade as, as, as public concern has is, is, is been heightened. This isn't, this isn't a, a, a witch hunt. This is, this is a question where we now see one body of evidence uh, heading in one direction and we see this policy kind of heading in another. And, and that's been debated here today. I don't know where the Congress is going to come down on, the, on, 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 that, uh, on that issue. But uh, um, struggle as you might with what you consider to be a fairly small, insignificant part of your jurisdiction compared to all of the other headaches and problems and concerns that you have, it's not so in the, uh, in, in the, in the public's mind. So Points are well taken, and uh, we'll take them to heart. I don't know. Are there any further questions? Uh, one more question. Chairman, thank you. Can you just tell me, Chairman Carr, uh, the numerical definition of low level, your, your numerical definition of low level, and does it differ, if you know, sir, with the numerical definition of uh, the Beer 5 report, which you cited earlier? Yes, the low level waste we're talking about here, the low levels of radiation we're talking about, are in the 10 millirem range. Uh, They're uh, talking about... The NRC, in so, the NRCs. Uh, yes, these levels are in the 10 millirem range, which is a thousand times lower than low level as the BR, as the Beer 5 committee looks at it in the 10 rem range. So that's the difference between their... Uh, what they call low level radiation is below 10 rem. So even uh, what might be three or four times higher to them still might not be up to your level? Down. Down to your level. Now, I'm a thousand times lower than they're talking about. <laughs> When they say low-level radiation is three or four times more harmful than we suspected, they're talking about a thousand times higher levels of radiation than we're discussing thank here. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you. Uh, Ms. Clark, you have no questions. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That concludes this hearing held by the House Interior and Insular Affairs Subcommittee on Energy and the Environment. Here is a reminder now to join us Sunday for a look at the race for the Ohio Governor's Chair. You will meet the state's Attorney General and Democratic nominee for Governor, Anthony Celebrezzi, and his Republican challenger, George Voinovich, Mayor of Cleveland. That's Sunday on Election 90, beginning at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time, 6.30 p.m. on the West Coast. Coming up next, it's a news conference on double taxation and the problems it could create for state and local governments. That should be encouraged. Ignorance of the law is no defense. Tune to C-SPAN's America and the Courts. You'll get in-depth information about the federal judiciary, recent cases and court procedures, and the opportunity to hear from legal experts, journalists,